Hello, welcome to the October 27th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in the live chat field or you can simply send questions in advance by emailing them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. I'm just going to mute my monitoring computer. Sorry. All right. Um, so when asking questions, I realize that uh, my ability to answer the questions in kind of a real-time manner will soon be eclipsed. And as we are, um, so if you don't see an immediate response to your question, um, we will get to it in time. But if we could avoid asking the same question over and over, if you don't see an immediate response, that would be appreciated. Um, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase you're running, whether you're on Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, if you are also uh, which operating system and which version number, so if you're version 11, 12 on Mac OS or Windows, that information is helpful. Um, we should have an index of all the topics pinned to the top of the comments field several hours after the live stream i'll take a dinner break go back rewatch the live stream and type up all the questions with timestamps so you can immediately navigate to a particular topic and if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams you could go to cubaseindex.com and we want to thank jan from stockholm for creating a wonderful website um, there's also a document that you can download from the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a wonderful place to find information on different topics uh, on that are relevant to the Steinberg community. We want to give Jazz Dude a special thanks for that. And we also have two people that serve as moderators, uh, Jazz Dude and Agent K. We will give special thanks to them. So once again, uh, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America. I primarily focus on Steinberg products and I'm presenting from outside of Washington DC area in Alexandria Virginia um, and if you're watching this live or even if you're watching a replay please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from it's always fascinating to see people from throughout the world uh, next Tuesday the live stream will be about two hours long and it's the last live stream of the month so we will do our customary a Zoom uh, social meetup, uh, and we're going to have a special guest of um, Tim Hinckley. Tim has kind of had a legendary career. He's been the keyboard player and done session work with so many amazing groups. Uh, he's originally from England. He's worked with the Rolling Stones, George Harrison, The Who, um, you know, Alvin Lee, Mitch Mitchell. You know, I think his first band was with. In Fleetwood Mac or Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac who was the drummer just kind of a legendary uh, you know producer songwriter Pam and B3 player just all-around wonderful musician so uh, and he's gonna share some insights of uh, his career and ask questions he's been a long time Cubase user so uh, and we will provide the link for the zoom meetup in the live stream on Tuesday, or if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could provide it for you in advance. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so we see um, Dr. Ayman, or I, Ayman, Ayman from, uh, from Jordan. Thanks for joining us. We have Jan from Holland. Michael Marshall from Somerset, UK, glad you can make it today, and Uno Memento from Finland. And Uno Memento asks, um, how do I get drum hits to match the bar lines if the drums are played on a keyboard MIDI without a click? Uh, the drums are played approximately 130 BPM, and Cubase's tempo is 120. So let's say I just want to... Um, I'll just roughly play something here and you know I'm not gonna I'm gonna do it without a click and I'll try to keep my drum part steady so I'll do a click as a count in so let's say we'll just come over here um, just activate our count in so I'll get maybe roughly uh, and you said 130 
So I'll do a count of 130 and then won't have the click continue after that. So make sure I have the click currently. Okay. So I just hit record. So now let's say we want this to get lined up on a beat. So there's probably a couple different approaches. So let's see, just I'll turn the click on now. We'll say 130. All right, so you see it's getting farther and farther off. Okay, so one of the things that I could do is just come over here. Uh, I'm going to lock the event. And let's just try going to our project menu to tempo detection. So we'll say analyze and now we will have our tempo. So now I want my tempo to be steady. So I'm going to turn off my tempo map and let's put it at 120 beats a minute. And what I want to do now will unlock the event. So Let's see if this. All right, so we can get my order of it. So let's say. Okay, so it's just. It's our original one. All right, so let's do. And I'll just duplicate this version for now. All right, so let's do a tempo detection from the events themselves. And let's see if we need to lock the MIDI. So we'll go project tempo detection, analyze. Okay, now we'll listen to it. do a quick offbeat correction. All right, so now let's say if I change my tempo now to 120. So that, you know, so once you do just a tempo detection of it, you know, try to um, then, you know, take the tempo and, you know, basically tell the tempo track not to be following the tempo and then uh, type in a steady tempo of 120, which is what we did, and then you should be all set. So try that. All right, we have a question from Asa Amadeus who asks, Hi Greg, I hope you're doing well. In Cubase 12, is there a way to convert all minor chords in a long performance to major chords? Thanks. All right, so I think I played something in here which is kind of very minor in nature harmonically. So let's say... So let's say I'll just. All right, so let's say we have kind of a, a you know, very much when we look at our melodic contour of this, this will be in A minor, so we see lots of C naturals. We'll see probably F naturals. So if I just wanted to take this in the MIDI editor, so in the MIDI editor itself, we could open up something called the scale assistant. So let's say the editor scale, I want it to be um, 
that it's currently in A minor and I want to change the scale here to A major. I could just select major now. Um, and then I could quantize pitches. So we'll see that all my C sharps will now, all my C naturals and F naturals should automatically switch to C sharp and F sharp. So once we do that, and now we could just have what was an entire phrase in, uh, in A minor, now play back in A major. If we undo that, we can see now it's going to play back in. So just in the scale assistant, and you have to have like the uh, MIDI editor as the focus, and then you could just come over here and just uh, set your scale and then quantize pitches, and then that will take long passages and automatically convert them to the new scale that you've defined. So you're kind of doing harmonic quantization, if you will. All right, so we have Make Some Music checking in from Germany. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so Dr. Amen asks, um, Hi, Greg, can you show me, please, how to create multi-instruments in Halion 7 and routing them separately to different outputs? Uh, all right, so let's say we're going to just start off. We will open up... Um, a instance of Halion. So I'm not sure if it's Halion or Halion Sonic, but it'll be pretty similar. So let's go ahead and add an instrument track. We will start with Halion. Principles will be similar. Right, so we're going to load up just a multi instrument. gonna wake up here all right all right so say um, here I want to have like a synth patch and now I wanted this to be a wavetable patch on slot two and let's go to Slot three, let's add kind of a, an FM patch. All right, so now we look at here. And let's say just a simple patch. Okay, so now we have... So we have different instruments that we could select. And as we do this, they're probably all now going out of the same output. So you select a different instrument, same output, same output. All right, so all those are identical. So when we want to change, all you'd have to do is go to, um, say we see right here I could say let's just send this one out the master I want this to go out of output two. once we do that that's now automatically added the output to our mixer and let's get to output four so now as we would play our different instruments so we see my first instrument is in this slot my second instrument is now here Let's go to the third instrument and our fourth instrument. And if you had, uh, if you're intending for Halion Sonic, it's really very similar. We could just open this up and when we go to the mixer, this is where we could see the 16 stereo outputs. So we could have each voice go to 16 stereo outs directly there. So let me know if that's helpful. Okay. All 
All right, so Ace Amadeus says, uh, Hi, Greg, what is the best way to add Groove Agent 5 drums to follow a music piece that has various unknown tempos? Thanks. So first thing you want to do is to do probably do a tempo detection on that piece uh, of the original piece so that it is a, a known tempo. So I'll just drop in just a quick... Um, file that is recorded without tempo Okay, so we'll take this file here. So there's no tempo. So when I come here, we'll just turn my click on. So I want to add an instance of Groove Agent with this. And we will just do like an R&B track with this. Okay, so what happens when we play this, the Groove Agent is going to automatically follow the, the timing from the sequencer. So we, we just have a steady tempo because we don't know what the tempo is in the file. So we're gonna play back at 120 beats a minute. So there's no real correlation. So what I want to do now is come over here, take this file, let's do our tempo detection of the audio file. So I select a file, let's come here and so now that we've done the tempo detection, the patterns in Groove Agent are just automatically following the tempo from those extracted from the track. So we extract the tempo from the event. And then Groove Agent is automatically following the tempo track that was extracted from the audio itself. So once you can do that, then that makes life so much easier. So give that a try, Ace. All right, wonderful to see Jan from Cubase Index on from Stockholm. Thanks for joining us today. Sorry, my chat field jumped to me. Let me just scroll back. All right, so we see a question from Mr. F uh, Fleskinus. Um, hi, Greg, very basic question. What is really the stereo in channel and what is purpose of it? For example, if I record a mono sound like vocals, uh, I see that the stereo in channel is active. So, you know, Cubase will, if we go to your uh, device or your studio menu to audio connections, by default, it will have just a stereo input so that there's an input to go along with your audio interface. So if I wanted to use my inputs here, we can see, okay, I have inputs one and two from uh, my audio interface. We could have that set up, but really all you would need to do at this point 
is you know just click on add bus and we could add a mono bus and then at this point you could just say um let's see if i have it connected maybe for an external yeah let me just turn that off okay so you know when we do this we could say okay i want to record stereo sources so i could have a stereo track now if i'm recording a mono track and I just have a stereo input so it's really there just to have an input to route things to so if I come and I have a mono track and let's say my microphone is plugged into input one I would just choose my stereo input and just choose left and that way I can record a mono source like a microphone uh, like on a vocal and just use a left input and route that when we could also come to your audio connections and we could you know just have the choice of you know a, one stereo input but we could also add two mono inputs so as we want to just come over here we could say okay i want to have input one and input two as mono sources so the stereo input is populated just so that you have an input to route audio you could choose to route it stereo record stereo if it's a mono source you'll have you'll probably see the waveform on one side and blank on the other or just simply from that stereo input choose left or right or add mono inputs so sometimes you may want to record stereo on inputs one and two sometimes you may want to record mono sources on different tracks so you could use the same physical input and have it defined as stereo or multi you know stereo or multi channel mode All right, uh, so we see from Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas. Uh, can you show once again in Vary Audio how to dissolve an audio track like bass or vocals to MIDI and properly assign the notes accordingly? Okay, so let's jump back. Okay, so here I'm going to have move this out of the way so here I have a a mono uh, vocal track so we'll just we'll just make this the active project all right so come here all right so if I wanted to now convert that all you have to do is go into very audio and let's say I just have this particular track selected so double click and we will under choose function we're going to choose extract midi and now as we look at we listen to our vocal we could see that the midi will automatically so let's say uh maybe we have this on a piano part so that's that would be all you'd have to do is you know so once again once you're here uh, and you'll have options if you want it to you know include pitch bend data if you don't want to include it where it's going to go if it, do you want it to create a new MIDI track do you want it to go to the project clipboard that's like when you copy something that you want to paste to another track or do you want to go to the selected track so that's all you have to do so you can see that's the midi extract it right there all right wonderful to see jazz dude on and we see value from vienna saying sending best greets from vienna to all around the world always wonderful to see matt elston on All right, so we have Panos on. I believe he's from uh, Greece, if memory serves. All right, we have Steve Thompson saying hello to everyone. 
John Cossigan. Always great to see John from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right, we have Ash Rebelhand Studios from Australia up in the middle of the night, probably 1.26 or 3.26 in the morning. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have Leonard Nielsen also saying hello to everyone. We see Benny from Sweden. All right, so we see... Um, Hi, people. Hope everyone's well. I'm currently on FL Studio user, but I want to switch to Cubase. But the cross-grade purchase option is unavailable at the moment. Anyone knows when it's available? So I think the online store was kind of officially relaunched today. So let's go ahead and just take a look. I think that you could... So it might not have been fully open yesterday, but I think <clears throat> that as of today... I haven't had a chance to play around with it yet. I don't know why it's taking so long. Okay, here we are. All right, so let's go, go over here. Let's say Cubase. <clears throat> so you can buy Cubase 12. And let's say you want to get Cubase Pro 12. Um, and competitive cross grade. So you could just do it right there. So it is available. So again, the online shop is back. So if you checked yesterday, it may not have been up but you know we'd love to have you become a cubase user so and thanks for joining the live stream all right so we see a question from got your uh how would i set up um live syncing insane computer with a video editing program so when i hit play in cubase it'll push the video editor i use davinci resolve i know you you would say render video um, first, then import. But what if I want to sync them instead uh, so I can make live changes to each Windows 10, Cubase Pro 12? So if you want Cubase to be the master, sorry about that. Um, if you want Cubase to be the master, you have to figure out if DaVinci Resolve can uh, be, you know, kind of the old terminology would, you know, if that could externally sync. Um, so if that's going to sync to timecode, then you could, you know, so, and generally there's going to be like two different forms of timecode. There's going to be MIDI timecode, which is timecode information sent over uh, like a MIDI cable through MIDI messages or SMPTE timecode. So if you want it, now often when you use timecode, you would need to have, uh, you know, between the two programs, you could have Cubase automatically send sync out of, so if we have an audio track, we can have Cubase send, you know, generate SMPTE time code. So as we come here, we can go to inserts and have Cubase send SMPTE time code and then it's under tools. So this could send SMPTE out of, and we could route this to its own audio output, send it into something that DaVinci Resolve will synchronize to. So I'm not familiar with DaVinci Resolve to know if it syncs externally to devices, but if, and if it does it to MIDI timecode, all you'd have to do is come over and say, you know, audio. So when we go to our transport, we would see project synchronization set up we would see destinations and we could say, we're gonna send MIDI timecode out of this port and have MIDI timecode received and set to external sync in DaVinci Resolve. So, you know, if you're doing SMPTE timecode, that could involve a actual synchronizer box that the other program is using. MIDI timecode, you can often get by with it, but you may also have to have um, for proper synchronization, 
a way for the clocks to be synchronized between like two different audio interfaces if you're using two different audio interfaces. So, you know, check to see, you know, but you could just come here, have Cubase spit out SMPTE timecode, you have Cubase spit out MIDI timecode and have DaVinci Resolve. If it could re if it could synchronize to those two, then you won't have a problem. So, but I don't know enough of DaVinci Resolve to know if I haven't, you know, I think I have a copy downloaded on an old computer, you know, but I'm not, I never tried doing, you know, to see if it would uh, externally synchronize. So. All right, so we have uh, Dardanello Grassi checking in from Turkey. Thanks for joining us today. And we have Lennart Nielsen from Sweden. All right, well, always wonderful to see Robert Higgins from Morro Bay. All right, we have Stefan from Sweden. We have our Swedish contingent on. All right, and we have Fabio checking in from Brazil. All right, Robert Higgins asks, uh, how to automate reverb from all wet to all dry over time? Let's say one minute in time. Okay, so I'll just take something we could do this with. Okay, so we could use kind of a, a send effect to do this, so let's say we want to go to um, our guitar. So I will come. Okay. All right, so we have kind of a dry guitar. And let's say we have a plate reverb here. All right, so one of the things you could do is I'm just going to, let's say, like while, where the guitar starts, I'm going to just quickly automate. So I'm just going to click on the W button. And I will just kind of come here. And I'll just kind of start an automation. We will open up the automation lane. And here we can see this is our send. So what I want to do is to take this send. And you could manually move it if you wanted to. But if you wanted to, uh, you know, probably the fastest way to do this, is just grab the line tool and say, OK, I want my guitar send to go from completely wet to completely dry. So. Once I've automated that parameter quickly, we can see that's going to pop up in a list of parameters or parameters that have automation on it. So as I watch this, we can have a very wet guitar. And then as we play, So he's doing kind of a straight linear fade out on the send. So we're a little, right about 40% of the reverb. I'll get very dry. Then we'll go back to where we were. So. So once again, just kind of go to the send, and if you want to automate it, that way it kind of just shows up as an automatable parameter. Click here to open up the automation lane, select the parameter that you want to draw in, grab your line tool, and then you could just kind of draw in just a straight kind of fade and say, I want to fade out over that much time, or I want to fade out to there and then fade into there to bring it back up. So pretty easy to do. And then just make sure when you're automating it, you just have the R and then that R will read the automation that was written in or recorded. All right.
All right, so we see uh, from Jam Tracks Reunion, hey Greg, is there a way in Cubase where I can show compression meters along with regular meters in the mixer to show how much compression is being used on each channel at a glance? So yeah, these will often be called like kickback meters. So let's say I want to take, um, let's take this guitar part here. We can see it like in, and I think it works with like the channel strip. So let's say I want to take, just make that reverb not sound so much. Okay, so I'm going to let's go to our, our full screen mixer. And we're going to come over here to, let's say, our channel strip. And let's apply compression. So if you look up here in the meter area, just to the left, you can see kind of the kickback meters of how much the compression is doing. So if we bypass this, we see that the compression is gone. You know, if we activate the channel strip, we can see how much of the meter is kicking back. So I don't think it's going to work with standard inserts, but with the channel strip, you could do it just that easily. All right, wonderful to see Brian Sawyer Sr. Says greetings from Plumbing Issues, North Carolina. It's been a hard week. And he's doing a house renovation. Says he thinks that they should release Cubase 13 out of sympathy for him. I'll pass it along. But it's already past business hours in Germany, I think. So, all right. So we have uh, Roland checking in from Sussex in England. Thanks for being online with us. All right. So we see Cubase Index um, it says uh, next uh, note next week. U.S. have uh, left daylight saving times, but EU still have. Uh, daylight same times for one more week equals live stream start. So I think we're not changing our clocks. It's a great point to bring up, Jan. Uh, I don't think we're changing our clocks until November 5th uh, in the U.S. So I'll kind of check to see if that's going to be in sync uh, with like European daylight saving times. But yeah, I'll try to remember to, to mention that uh, next week as well to be aware to check the times. All right, so we see from uh, Home Studio World. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, I feel that jazz style is not as other styles. I mean, library loops. Please show us more Steinberg products um, if available. So, you know, if you want to, you know, like a lot of jazz stuff is like the drums can be, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, some of the hardest things to do for, you know, kind of authentic jazz stuff with loops. And there's two great um, like Groove Agent expansions. So we'll go ahead and show a couple of them. I think I may have, we'll see if I have both of them installed. One is gonna be just a uh, jazz drum. So let's go ahead and load a kit with patterns. Uh, see if I have, I may not have that installed on my demo computer, but I, I and the other one is the uh, Simon Phillips jazz drums. So this is sold as an add-on. But if you wanted to do, like, you know, wonderful jazz drum events here. So you could have kind of your different, you know, and if you want to
So like the Simon Phelps is really good for brushes where you kind of can come over here. Adjust the complexity of it. similar with brushes. And then you always get to have Simon Phillips playing on your track, which is kind of cool. One of the all time great suits can, one of the few drummers that could so easily, seamlessly go back and forth between pop, rock, and jazz, you know, playing with, you know, from Judas Priest to Toto to The Who, um, and all sorts of great stuff. So check out like the Simon Phillips jazz and there is like a jazz, another jazz um, groove agent kit. And those are like really the hardest ones to do. So, you know, check out those for jazz content. Always wonderful to see David Ruder and Kristen Preecy from Big Tent in Nashville. Hope you guys are doing great. All right, so we see um, from Jam Tracks Union, is there a plugin workflow view in Cubase that shows gain in, gain out of each plugin in a series on a given track? I uh, cannot find this in Cubase 12 Pro. So, you know, if we have, you know, you know, let's say we have, uh, you know, 16 different plugins that are showing kind of the gain going on in, you know, particular tracks, there's not like a gain meter for each plugin you know, for each insert or each EQ stage, you know, you can see, uh, you know, the difference. So let's say if we are here, you know, when we look at, let's say we have on a guitar, you know, we're squashing it here. So we could look at our guitar part and change the meter input. So if we want to see our input position be the input of what the what it's going on the file and what it's going to be also post fader so this way we could see like as I adjust my fader or the compression on it so let's say we could see the result in the meters depending on your meter position but it's not going to show you, you know, the gain of, you know, every every single stage that could affect gain, and that could be in, you know, um, at least twenty areas that I could just think of off the top of my head. So you know, so it may not tell you a lot, but you know, just be cognizant of your gain as you're adding plugins. But you know, you could see what it was originally versus what it's going to be post fader, what it's going to be post fader, post panner as well. All right, so we have uh, Lawrence Koch from Barn Door, Bar Barn Door Recording from Rhode Island. Glad you can make it today. All right, and we have uh, Hello from Japan. I wish I could read, I guess it's kanji, so. But thank you so much for joining us. We just don't have too many people from Japan. I know it's a weird time and my Japanese is really bad. All right. All right, always wonderful to see Nick from Essex in the UK. All right, so we see, uh, thanks Greg, is it possible, question, to get to EQ transients uh, and tonal separately in Cubase? To me, it's important. Um, Cubase 12 Pro, 10 thanks um so you know we we could do it kind of within not necessarily with eq i think you know the only you know we could if we have the um you know we can't separate the tonal from the transients but a lot of stuff you could come over here and you know if you need it to just do transients on particular frequencies 
you could activate the dynamic mode of you know of the so let's say we will just come over here you know so you could activate the dynamic mode of frequency so you have the dynamic eq uh but you know it's it doesn't necessarily have the ability to split the transients from the tonal characteristics it's something like split eq the i think it's even tied which has that so maybe we'll see something in the future with that but currently there's nothing in cubase that does it and i think the split eq is still we could do it for like creating instrument sounds uh so you know we could do that you know we could do it inside of you know while not necessarily uh in eq if we wanted to take a guitar file and you know or the, let me just find i'll just do like a, a drum loop let me just open up a project you know we could break it apart in spectral layers so uh, but it doesn't necessarily do it as an EQ, but we'll just to say we want to break apart, you know, our files. We, we could break it apart. So as we come over here and we'll load this into spectral layers. It's not necessarily like a real-time process, but we can split it into layers and then you can put plugins on each layer if you need to. So as we come over here, we can now let me say unmix. Uh, I think if we come here, we can say unmix um, components. So here we could break apart the tonal and the transient. So again, we'll go to unmix components and we'll hit OK. So now each of these could be its own layer. So as we would play back, so we could look at the tonal, the transients, or noise. And all three of those together will do that. So at this point, you know, if we wanted to, I could just grab like if, okay if i wanted to eq the tonal aspects i could drag that in as a separate file and let me eq the noise and just drag it and create a track and then we could apply separate eq on each of the tracks but it's not going to do it in real time so if you need to do that you could use like the full uh you know the full spectral layers and be able to do that and have a lot of flexibility then you could re mix and kind of break apart the different elements um, without necessarily you know and it gives you a lot more flexibility so if you have spectral layers you know play around with that it's a great choice all right okay let's see the next question um All right, so we see Gothic Melancholy says Cubase 13. So, you know, as soon as it's released, we'll be showing it. So I'm not going to show it before it's released. So, um, so, but I think things will be happening pretty soon. So, all right, so we see from Wilfried uh, Godert, I guess the new Steinberg shop promote the wrong time with discounts. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, what time zone you live in, but I think that there are pretty, like, the messages that I saw had, like, you know, time, uh, you know, is a limited uh, promotion to test kind of initial testing of the online shop. So if you live, you know, so I thought they gave it in Central European time. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, what time zone you're in. Okay, so, uh, Roland Stuff asks, uh, Hi Greg, the quantizing pitches you showed today, can that be applied within very audio? So audio generated harmony tracks always contain sensible notes for the scale being used. So yeah, you could definitely do that. So um, once you're in very audio here, so let's just jump back. Right, 
So now that we are here, we could say, um, but you have the scale correction. This came in version 12. So we could just say, okay, we want to use this scale. I want it to be C, let's say melodic minor and come here, quantize pitch. And you could just do it like that. So, so you can do scale correction within the very audio. We see John Koskin says the Simon Phillips Jazz Collection is great, but an additional cost. All right. Wonderful to see Razel checking in from, from Denmark. And great to see David M. from Liverpool area. Chatfield jumped on me, so let me find my spot. All right, uh, all right, so I think I'm back. Okay, so we see from Got Your, I uh, really feel the need to make the tempo adjustments easier in Cubase. We get this kind of question five times in a different way per live stream. It's hard to remember and understand for most. So I think, you know, selecting the event and going to tempo detection isn't so bad, you know, but there's a lot of different scenarios, you know, so realize that, oh, if you have existing MIDI information, that when you do a tempo detection, you don't want the MIDI to automatically go to the new file. So you may have to, um, at that point, lock the MIDI and then unlock it after the tempo detection so that it then falls. So there's a lot of different scenarios and you know Cubase can accommodate just about every different scenario. Um, so, you know, but really it's often just, you know, doing the tempo detection from a selected MIDI or audio. And I think that's pretty straightforward. We see Mark Rabin checking in from Montana. I saw it was snowing in Montana. We hope that you're staying in and warm if you got snow, Mark. Our best to Stella. And we'll all say woof woof to Stella. Mark's dog is a loyal attendee as well. Too bad Stella can't hit the like with her paw. And if you do learn a new tip or trick, you can't hit the like button. All right, so we see Steinberg MIDI just saying, hey, Greg. So great. Glad you can make it today. All right, and we see JVI on. Glad you could be here. All right, we see Pano says you remember well. So it's my social interaction, being interacting with, internationally with people from all over. It's, it's always wonderful to get a sense of where people are. It makes it easier for me to do the live streams. All right, so we have uh, Mr. Fleskness has forgot to introduce himself before. He's Anders from Linköping, Sweden. Um, and he has a continuation on his stereo in question. Uh, his question is, why is it or a mono equivalent needed? Why not record directly the vocal track channel? Well, it depends on what source you're, you know, if you need mono or stereo, it depends, you know, if you're recording Two, if you're using two microphones, you would want to use a stereo source. So uh, let's say you're recording guitar and you wanted to use one microphone, you know, two microphones that were spaced out to kind of give it more of a stereo image. 
uh, or if you have a piano and you want to you know do closer miking on the low and high notes where often you use two or three microphones so that's when you could you know and if you're just recording a voice your voice probably is going to be recorded on one microphone if you're recording bass you probably have a single source the bass you know like an electric bass could be a mono instrument if you're recording a uh, synthesizer like a hardware synthesizer let's say like a yamaha montage uh, you know you, you want to you know it's intended to work as a stereo output so you want to capture be able to capture the source correctly on what the source is outputting so some devices instruments will be stereo you know if you're recording a guitar part where the guitarist has uh, multiple cabinets and they have a stereo delay that goes back and forth between the left and right cabinets you could do that you know some guitarists like Peter Frampton for instance will have uh, like his guitar recording scenario is three cabinets where the middle is unaffected and the left and the outer left and outer right cabinets have the effects so he would record like three mono sources or you could record a stereo and a mono source depending on what flexibility he needed later so different sources your voice doesn't come out of two speakers um, so that's generally going to be recorded as a mono source and thanks for introducing yourself and welcome to the live streams See, Stella says sync used to be a post-traumatic stress disorder word. So yeah, it's always the old days of synchronizing to multi-track tapes or video decks and, you know, simply bleeding into track 23. Not so much fun. I don't mind not using synchronization. Okay, so we see uh, the Cubase to cross create information was already available when the store was disabled. Instead of add to cart, it says available soon. Um, yeah, so check, I'll, I'll check just real quick uh, and see. And it could be different depending what country you're in. Okay, so we see available soon. So, um, so yeah, so I'll see if there's, I'll mention it that people are wanting to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, so I see that. You're right. So it's so add to cart. So it could be that that's maybe not fully implemented in the system. Um, but, you know, there are promotions throughout the year as well and probably now if you did buy Cubase you might be able to get a grace period update to the next version and save some money that way as well if I could speculate Okay, so uh, Matt Elder asks, uh, Hi Greg, Matt from Toronto here. I was just wondering if you're able to save drum maps and have Cubase remember, or do you just have to keep importing them? So, you know, if you start off with a template, so, you know, it's going to be saved when you save a project. So as soon as I, uh, I will go to here, I have like drum maps that are saved within the project. So once we have the, the drum map set up, it's going to be recalled in the project. Uh, if it's a groove agent, one of the things that you could do is just come over here and import and create drum maps from the instrument. So you don't necessarily have to import it all the time. You could save it within a track preset. You could start off with a template. Uh, but it, And if you don't start from a template you know you could just create the drum maps but if you go to you know the drum map setup once you go here to and you say okay i want to do a new map and we say okay this is going to be this 
and we come over here and we say save we'll call this October 27th 2023 and let's go to a new project let's add an instrument track okay I want to go to my drum map setup um, let's see if it's so it looks like it's not stored or it could be all right so let's see if we load Looks like, yeah, I mean, I, I know it's stored within the project, um, but All right, I'll jump back to back to here and we'll see it again. saved it right okay okay so I'm just gonna put this to my desktop So you could load it up, um, but I think if you start with a template, that it will automatically be saved within your template as well. But you could looks like you could load it up independently. So I'll play around a little more with that, but thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so Mark Raven asks, uh, I have a question about using more than one interface. Do you get buffer latency of a particular unit or cumulative buffer size? So it is going to be compounded, so it will be cumulative. So it will basically be uh, working with the latency added together of both interfaces. So it's another kind of thing that's not so great with it. All right, so we see DL White just says it got drenched down there in North Texas. Great mixing weather, so good day to watch a live stream. All right, so we see uh, is, is Cubase suitable for the EDM genre? So, yeah, definitely. I mean, I talked to, you know, like just this week, I was helping out Zed in his camp. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was helping Circuit. So, lots of guys doing EDM stuff that do it entirely in Cubase, so. All right, 
great. So we see from Got Your, just says, thanks, Greg, for answering sync questions. I used to do a lot of the kind of thing in the old days with MIDI timecode, MTC, and SMPTE. Uh, you woke my mind to some ideas on how to make it work. Thanks. All right. That's good. Yeah, it's, I don't miss those days. I remember the studio I used to work at in New York was, you know, they had a Roland SBX80 as kind of the sync box for all the sequencers, which had the notoriously probably the worst manual of any piece of music equipment ever written. It's kind of very comical to read. All right, great to see Michael Teens on. Don't have to worry about being tardy. Is getting groceries. He has to eat and keep his gr youthful girlish figure. All right. All right. So we see Robert Higgins like the automated reverb question answer. That's great. All right. So we see from uh, Wilfried. Uh, is today is zoom so you know we have the last live stream will be on the 31st um, so we'll be doing the zoom on the 31st uh, it is Halloween here in the US I know some people asked if they could wear Halloween costumes on the zoom you could do whatever you want I probably won't uh, but and we will be having our special guest uh, Tim Hinckley uh, so yeah who's just had just an uh, astonishing amazing career you know so I'm looking forward to having him be able to share some of his stories and insights with you guys. All right, so we have Peter from Montreal just dropped in to say hello. All right, X Cubase X is in, so you don't have to worry about being tardy. You just have to hit the like button immediately. That's your only punishment. All right, so DL White asks, Hi, Greg, if I want to move my project to a different drive, is backup project the best way? Will work as a normal project file location, all files and references, thanks. So yeah, if you have a particular project and you wanted to you know, move everything that's required in that project to work from a new drive location, the backup project is kind of the best way to do it. So as we are working with it, uh, all you have to do is go to your file menu, choose backup project, here it's going to prompt you to, okay, we're going to define a completely separate new folder where we want all the files to be moved to. So your original files will be intact in the location. Create a new folder. So we'll call this October 27 backup. So we'll select that folder. Uh, you could give it the project name. Uh, and then you have some different options. You want to keep this current project active. Uh, do you want to minimize audio files? And what this means is if we had audio files where we did a 10 minute recording and we used 30 seconds of 10 minutes, do we want to back up the nine minutes and 30 seconds of the audio that we didn't use? So if you don't want that to make it smaller, do you want to make direct offline processing permanent? where this where if we did an offline process and said okay i applied an effect on this part of the file cubase will keep the original file and the processed file um, if you don't want to ever go back to the original file you could choose that you could remove unused files so files that aren't used in a project why back them up uh, you could choose not to you could choose to exclude the video file or do not back up the mix down folder so, and that was added in Cubase 11, where you could have within the project folder itself, just a folder called Mixdown. And at that point, the Mixdown will, uh, you could choose not to back up that folder. Then once you do that, all the files are copied to the new location and it's super nice and clean. So if you were sloppy with maybe file management and files were 
record it into different locations. That's a great way, kind of a, we forgive you, you made a mistake, let's fix the mistake and make it easy for you to work from the new location. All right, so we see um, Estrada Base asks, uh, can it swing in a straight ahead style using Simon? So yeah, you get all sorts of, you know, within the Simon Phillips drums, within the patterns themselves, you could add swing, you could add swing uh, directly on, you know, the, you know, to the MIDI data, if you drag the patterns out. So yeah, you have a lot of flexibility for, you know, working with the different amount of swing and how you want to deal with it. All right, so we see, uh, let's see from Wilfried says, when Steinberg reserved the offer the shop and speculators can run his VST3, it's an option. But I guess you cannot use it inside DaVinci Resolve as VST3 plugin. So generally, spectral layers, you know, I think is really designed more for ARA2. Um, so, you know, that's how you would kind of get the audio in and out of the system. So maybe see if DaVinci Resolve has uh, ARA2. And usually when it's more complex of going into a, you know, not just processing audio, but going into a different editing environment, then ARA2 gives you more flexibility with that. So check to see if you have ARA2 work. All right, so Michael Teams has granted my family and myself uh, one gallon of strawberry cheesecake ice cream. So sounds lovely. Thank you, Michael Teams. We're in an unusually warm day today. It's like 80 degrees here in Washington, D.C. area. Right, you see Peter is out shopping with his wife. He'll be back in a while. Enjoy your time with your wife. All right, so we see, um, I see in Steinberg webpage are multiple expansions for Groove Agent. Are there any expansions for Halion available with Cubase Elements? And we see the ones for Pad Shop and Retrolog. Yes, there's lots of Halion content, so let's just come back over here so let's close this out let's go to instruments um, so we see a lot of these particular instruments here so let's say okay you want to go to ethnic flute phrases these all work inside of Halion so a lot of the instruments that we see that are sold here um, you know, like if you wanted to get FM Lab, you could now just kind of come over Kalimba, Colors Vintage. So, you know, the Hybrid Bundle, Iconica Opus, you know, all of these, you know, for, um, you'll see a lot of, so guitars, M guitar, T guitar, these are all running guitar harmonics, tails, uh, Cinema, you know, all these that we're seeing here run inside of Halion, the electric bass, um, backbone and groove agent are separate instruments, uh, pan drum, hybrid hit. I think all these are inside, you know, the, the Olympus choirs. So, pretty much most of these are running inside of Halion, the orchestral stuff. So the Hyperion Brass, Halion Symphonic Orchestra, Vertigo Strings, Vertigo Violin. So, you know, uh, the Grand is separate, but Amped Electra, um, Four Knob Upright, you know. So the vast majority of these will be running inside of, you know, when you think of Halion as kind of the playback engine where those instruments will use, will be played back through. Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. All 
All right, so we see Ash Rebel Hen Studios. Uh, question, hi Greg, uh, thanks for saying hello. Uh, I noticed in the lower console panners, you have some tracks with the single point pan and some with the stereo field. Is there a reason for your preference? Uh, it's probably whatever I may have changed it to. So if you're familiar with this, if we have like a stereo track, um, there are two different panning options. So when we want to come over here, we could choose to have a balance panner so we could move the item from the left to the right channels. But if it is a stereo source, we may want to use a combined panner. So when we come over here to the combined panner, this way I could say, I want it to be in stereo, uh, I want it to be panned wide or I want it to be very kind of mono focused, like center focused, or I want it to be narrow focused, but on the right side or on the left side. So I don't, in, I don't have probably a particular reason why I may have switched some and saved it to have, to show both for demonstration purposes. Um, but depending on the source, you know, you have the option to go back and forth. And if you want your stereo panners to be set a particular way, it is a preference in Cubase. So let's say, um, so if you go to VST, you could have it be the combined panner or the stereo balance panner. So. So no real particular reason. All right, so, um, so we see from uh, Norte Web, uh, there's any way to control external gear like effects machine using MIDI CC. So really all you have to do is add a MIDI track to it. Um, take that MIDI output to a MIDI output port where your device is connected figure out what the CC data is. So if it's like modulation or something like that, all you would have to do is create an empty part. We could double click on the part and say, okay, this is gonna respond to MIDI controller one. And if we needed to do this, or if we needed to do program changes, you know, say, okay, at this point I need it the effect unit to start here. When it goes into the chorus, I need it to go to there, and then the bridge, it's here. And then we're back to where we started with. So you could do program changes, and you could do MIDI CC data. It's just sending a MIDI track out to wherever the device is connected, USB or a MIDI port. You want to direct the particular MIDI output to the correct spot, and from there, um, it will feed whatever information is needed for your external effects device. So, very easy to do. All right, so we see Mark Raven has 18 inches of snow in Montana, and Stella loves my voice. And see, and Stella, Mark's dog, is happy to be here. All right. All right. So we see Cap Energy Music from Pennsylvania says, Yes, definitely hit the like, guys and gals. That way, keep the videos coming. Okay. So we see from uh, just a question, please teach Slap House music production tutorial. Um, you know, generally, I, I don't. I'm, you know, if you want to email me an example of a slap house, uh, slap house music, um, I'd be happy to kind of mimic it. I mean, generally, you don't say make a rock track. You know, we're just, you know, generally the intention is to, you know, we could show you how to do stuff, but you know, like I may not play the guitar part or do something. But if you want to send an example, 
like a YouTube link, you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de and be happy to uh, you know try to create it for Tuesday's live stream. All right, we see Dr. Amen just says thanks a lot, Greg. All right. All right, so we see uh, from uh, says so sorry for sticking to the stereo in question. What I'm really asking for is why not skip the in channel completely, regardless of mono, stereo, multi channel? Why not record directly onto the target track? Well, the problem is if you're recording, you know, multiple sources at once, let's say you're recording your guitar and voice and drums and bass and keyboards, how do you define which instrument goes to which? Uh, to which track so I think it's pretty you know it's a pretty fair paradigm to define what the input source is for the track you're recording you know it's just like um, if you're to you know connect a if you had three guitar amps and you're a guitarist you would connect the cable into the amplifier that you want to hear so we could really think of it as kind of the same way you know if I had a microphone and different PA systems. I had four PA systems. I wouldn't expect all the PA systems to pick up the microphone. I would make a connection from the microphone into the mixer of the PA system so that we could, you know, establish a connection so that it's not picking up just any source. Okay, so we see Alex Morgan. Uh, great to see you on. Uh, hi, Greg. Thanks for all your help. Question: How to do? How do I get the key editor window to always open as a separate display other than the main one on Mac? Uh, it always opens on monitor one, and I wish to change. So it, the key editor will always, you know, if you know, first off, if you go to the preferences and we go to editors, we could say when we double click, we could open into uh, a separate window. Okay, so let's say we have that selected. I double click now. It's in a separate window. If this window is, you know, I close this window, this window will be retained, the, the placement of the window. So when I double click on a MIDI part. We can see that the MIDI key editor is in this, the same spot. And if that is on a secondary display, that is where it will open. So at this point, we double click and it's going to be you know, directly showing these particular events. So wherever this window is last placed is where the window will be recalled when you get to open up MIDI data again. But you may have to set the preferences in under editors to double click opens instead of the lower zone into a separate window. All right, wonderful to see uh, Jeff Sabelski from Chico, California. All right, so we see Doug O wishing everyone uh, everyone a happy weekend, all the fellow Clip Cubase warriors. All right, so we see Jim Fox on, who lives just a couple miles away from me. Uh, known for 20 plus years, has just got back from AES. Uh, could not find a Yamaha booth, but Chuck Ainley played back some incredible sounding Atmos mixes in the at the Neumann booth. Uh, he said, uh, "Mix in Nuendo with built-in renderer, awesome." So that's great. Yeah, Yamaha. You know, this year, uh, you know, usually when Yamaha does a show, we have to bring a lot of stuff and it could be very expensive. And New York is kind of a prohibitively expensive trade show area. And this year, um, with the kind of postponement of the NAM show, we have within one fiscal year, we have two major NAM shows and that's a lot of money for exhibiting. So we've cut back on trade shows so that we could do two NAM shows, which is kind of more 
globally align for Yamaha, but I, I missed going to AES. I always enjoy the AES show. Uh, but, but we, you know, if you just share what Chuck was playing, I know I've been helping him with uh, Frampton Comes Alive in Atmos. And when he was first getting set up, we did, I helped him get set up for uh, the Lyle Lovett big band stuff, which was just fabulous, his mix he did with it, you know, with like each each uh, wind player, you know, in different speakers, taking different solos, trading solos was really wonderful. Chuck does such great work. All right. Um, so we have a question from 2R Studios. Uh, hi, Greg. Can I disable listen mode from an input from the Mix 1 main monitors UR824? I always hear the DSP Yamaha reverb going through the main speakers, not only headphones. Thanks in advance. Um, so what it could be is uh, I don't have a UR824, so it's kind of handled a little differently. But if you go to your studio, you might see an audio device set up, and it might be under more options. Um, and then once you see that, you can open up a little control panel and you'll see like two knobs and one of them will be like a reverb return. And it's usually like the knob. You know, so, and what you could do is just turn that knob down and I can't really show it cause I don't have a UR 824 interface anymore. Um, but that's how you could, you know, so try turning it off from there, you know, from your, um, studio menu to uh, it's like audio hardware setup and it may show up in this little more options and you could turn the reverb off there so give that a shot all right so we have glenn dozier checking in from suffolk virginia all right so we have another virginian on thanks for joining us glenn hope you're well All right, so Doug O asks, Hi Greg, are there controller maps for earlier models of the Akai MPK Mini Play, MIDI Mix, Novation Launch, Key 61, maybe a collection online anyone knows of? Also, did you see the question I emailed in? Um, so I, I'm not sure which particular question was mailed in, uh, but I have like six or seven that I'll be going through later. Um, as far as the remote control scripts, you know, there is, if you go to the Steinberg forums, there is an area where you could actually, you know, where there's kind of a collection of different MIDI remote templates that people have created and shared. So I would look in there first and Jazz Dude may be able to post a link to it, um, to Doug O, so you could, um, you could look in there as well. But generally it's like the, actual hardware companies are creating the controller scripts for the most part. Okay, we see from Jeff Sabelski, uh, Greg been so busy, Cubase 12 Pro, I have the extension now from inside Cubase, I also needed to render a file to the extension was available, uh, but WaveLab 11.2, still no license uh, for it workflow. Um, so Jeff, if you want to email me, just like look in the Steinberg activation manager. Now what may happen if you go to your My Steinberg account, so go to steinberg.net, log into your My Steinberg account, and you may have a voucher. All right, so, uh, so look under vouchers, uh, and then you may have a voucher that will, you know, take your WaveLab 11 from an e-licensor and transition it to the Steinberg licensing. But see if, you know, see if you have like Cubase 11, if you open up the Steinberg activation manager, if you have Cubase 11 activated or deactivated there, if you don't see it listed in the deactivated or activated column, go to your My Steinberg account, log in with your My Steinberg credentials. And then at that point, just simply uh, look in the vouchers area, and then you could kind of follow the directions to transition from an e-licensor to the Steinberg licensing that's required for WaveLab 11.2. OK, 
Okay, so DL White asks, um, Greg, I have a project that is playing reverb on several tracks. Traced all my paths, imported a fresh file from the pool where it plays dry. On import, it has reverb. Uh, Mac to Windows migrant, please help. Um, so, you know, one of the things is if you have, you know, go to the visibility tab and make sure that all of the tracks here are visible. And it could be that the reverb, you know, might be in a folder. So let's say if I added a couple of reverb returns, so I'm going to add several effects channels. Okay, so we'll add a couple revelations. And then if these are created inside folder, all right, so we may have the reverb here. And it could be maybe in an effects channel folder. So make sure that, you know, that folder may be closed. So check to see if you have like an effects channels. Um, if you, you know, know which reverbs you're using, you might be able to also just come in here and type in like REV and then you could select the tracks uh, just by searching. Um, and if you want to send me, uh, if you want to email me a project, you don't have to include any content with it. Uh, but if you want to email a project, I, I could probably find kind of the routing. One method that you could do is, let's say, I have uh, particular tracks that are going to a reverb. And let's say this is also being sent to a group. So let's say we go to my sends, and this is going to... Just add a group channel. So this vocal is going to sends and it's going to our group. So if we open up the channel settings, so you can click on the E here. Um, one of the things that you could do is you could just come right here and say, um, show the output chain. So if you know that like, okay, this voice has um, you know, what this is going to do is come over here and this voice is going to, uh, you know, this, you know, at this point we could say, okay, it's going to three targets. So we could say, okay, now this is, this vocal is going to, you know, my room works reverb. This is also going to, and once you kind of click here, you could just, you know, go to your different targets and what's feeding those targets. So we say, okay, I want to go, let's say to this voice, the vocal is going to three targets. So this is going, you know, so we could click right here on the targets and see exactly where this particular track, it, what reverb it's going to, what group it's going to, what stereo out it's going to. So give that a try and then that will expose on the track that you're hearing reverb all of the routing options. And again, if you want to share a project file, I'd be happy to take a look at it and you can just send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so let's say uh, from Home Studio World, uh, Greg, can I in one click convert all stems to match the same output level per stem? So let's say if we had a number of files and this could work horizontally, horizontally or vertically, select the files and you could come over here, go to audio, to processes, you could say normalize and that way they could all normalize to a constant value if you wanted to do that. So select all the tracks, go to audio, to processes, normalize. So you could try that, see if that gets you where you want to be. See, Lawrence Koch is looking for um, 
any recommendations on music instrument shops or places to visit while there. So I think uh, Mark Rabin used to live in New Orleans. So there's a lot, you know, I think he moved maybe after Katrina, but maybe Mark Rabin might be able to share some. I haven't been to New Orleans in a long time, unfortunately, but you'll have fun. All right, Estrada Base asks, uh, can we use sound libraries from Cubase and other DAWs or just as standalone? So if it's like an instrument, you could use the instruments, you know, because, uh, you know, it's being played back through Howley and Sonic SE, and that works as an AU, VST, or AAX plugins. Um, but if it's the content, I, I'm not sure, you, you may be able to see the content may be protected, like loops, those may be protected uh, to work only in Cubase, but the if it's like an instrument sound, um, you know, like a lot of the sample playback instruments, uh, and you could purchase Retrolog and Pad Shop to use in other DAWs as well. Okay, Jeff Sabelski, we see he's like number 74. Thank you for that, Jeff. All right, so we see from uh, Rex Effect. Uh, hello, Greg. Uh, Cubase Pro 12, Mac Mini M1. Sorry, having problems with audio connection. Input device keeps disconnecting. This doesn't happen with any of the other DAWs. Please help, thanks. Um, if you could let me know which particular uh, audio interface it is, if it's a USB interface, um, you know, if it, or, or which interface you're using so if it's like headphones like bluetooth device if you could share that information so you know with bluetooth it could be just losing connection sometimes usb you know bluetooth could also be limited in the sample rate uh, usb could be limited with power supplies and power options in cubase as well so if it's like an underpowered usb port that could cause problems for you as well so but if you uh if you could share what audio interface that you're using that could be helpful all right oh you said wonderful to see gerald ely from martinez california all right so we see paul mccartney jeff Sabelski says paul mccartney rocks slash punks out on a new rolling stones album dirty 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 bass cool sound I heard about it, but I haven't heard the track yet. But, you know, you have to remember Paul was an early fuzz bass devotee from Rubber Soul. All right, so we see a question from Keith Young. Great to see you on the live stream. Uh, Greg, Cubase 12 on Mac Mini. Uh, lost sound for a while, resolved by deactivating slash activating constrained delay. And plugins, please. Advice, how to keep the plugins and how to check latency on an individual plugin. Thanks. All right, so when you want to see the uh, latency on an individual plugin, if you go to... Uh, your studio menu and we go to plugin manager so let's click on a plugin um, I think it might you might be able to see it let's see if it's in Right, so you can see the latency listed right here in the plug. So you can see the latency indicated right there on a plug-in basis. So you can see like auto panner. If we go to distortion, let's go to multi-band stuff is always fun and generally latent. So you can see the number, the latency in samples right there. Now, if you want to see it in milliseconds, what you could do is if you go to like the full mixer, you could activate the channel latency settings here. So if you go to the setup window, activate the channel latency, and 
as plugins are instantiated so let's say we'll go here to the inserts i want to add a you know a multi-band so we see kind of the total amount in milliseconds of the plugin delay on that particular track and if we click on this little drop down arrow you could see the exact latency in milliseconds or samples of each particular plugin. So you could see it just listed right there. All right, great to see Tommy C on the live stream. All right, so we see from uh, Knockhead Studio. Greetings, Greg. How can I export my track separations with plugin settings embedded into the WAV files for it to be imported into another DAW with Final Mix still intact? All right, so we'll just go to, I'll just add some reverb on a tracker. I think we could. Let's go here. This should work. Okay, so let's say we're listening to this particular project. So we have reverb on the kick. And we have reverbs on a guitar. And these are all being fed into our reverb right there. So if I wanted to export this with all of the effects kind of baked in where the effects are going to be applied, even though they're now all running in real time, what we could do is go to your file menu. We want to set the left and right locators around the event. Let's go to our file menu. We'll go to export audio mix down. We want to select multiple. So I say, okay, I want to include my We'll bypass my stereo out. I want my groups to be rendered, my drums, guitars, keys. I want to render my effects by themselves. I want to render my virtual instruments and all of my tracks. All right, so the key setting as to what particular processes are will be embedded is in this effects section. So we could choose to leave it disabled, which will just export all the files as stems uh, without any processing, we could include the inserts and channel strip. So that would be like the EQ, the built in channel strip, insert effects. And we could also include send effects by choosing groups plus group slash sends. And if we have an effect on the master bus, we could include the master section as well. So I'm going to come over here and include the groups and sends. And let's just create a new project. So I'll say, let's export my audio mix down. All right. Give it a couple seconds here. So we want to make this kind of Homer Simpson easy so that someone can't mess up your audio file. So you hand it off to them. It's kind of pre-mixed. And we could set up different, you know, different, uh, different selections, different functions. It's rendering here. All 
right, and now here's our new project. So if we see our groups, we'll be kind of our drum group. Now when we want to come over to our kick and our snare, so all the reverbs are just kind of baked. All the panning is intact. So that's all you have to do. So again, just come over to export, audio mix down, and select, go to select multiple, and then you could under effects, select group, uh, sends and then all of the effects in it, or if you have master effects that you wanted included, you could choose that as well. All right. All right, you see Michael Teams recommending the graveyard tour. It's very interesting. I think I did that once in New Orleans. So that is pretty interesting. Sometimes people get a little too voodoo on you. So. All right, so we see from Tommy C, uh, Greg, how are, how are our username and passwords gonna get transferred over to the new online store? Thanks. Um, so I, I haven't tried it yet myself, um, but I think that the online, you know, the credentials that you use for the AskNet store are no longer, uh, I, I would, and this is just speculation on my end because I haven't done it yet, but I would think that those are not going to work and it may be tied directly into your My Steinberg account. Um, but I'll have to try to buy something and, and find out. All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer on from Mission Viejo. It says, thanks Cubase and Greg for all you do to make Cubase the best DAW. Thank you very much, kind words. All right, so we see from uh, Wilfried, it says, by the way, DaVinci Resolve does not support ARA2. Long was no reason to support VST3. It comes because Dolby Atmos was necessary, so no deal with Steinberg. Uh, Isotope RX support. Um, yeah, I mean, you should reach out to you know, realize that some things are going to be better integrated for editors, you know, not running in a typical plugin format. So, but, you know, reach out to DaVinci Resolve and see, you know, ARA2 is in kind of an industry standard if they're going to be utilizing it. But, you know, also realize that uh, you could run, you know, uh, spectral layers as standalone. All right, so we see uh, Home Studio World says, uh, Greg, how I will follow you next month, not clear to me. It seems you will not continue via YouTube. Thanks, so we're always gonna be doing these on YouTube. Generally what happens the last live stream of the month, like after our first, you know, nine months of doing live streams, you know, we decided for Christmas uh, to do just like, you know, where people could go on a Zoom meeting and just kind of meet it's not necessarily like presenting stuff but we may have special guests and share insights and actually have other people talk and communicate with each other and you could meet people from all over the world that are on the live streams which is you know and it's really always wonderful conversations i look forward to it every month so we will always do the live streams uh, but because of the popularity that we had on the christmas kind of get together we, we call it like a christmas social um, people wanted to keep doing that. So we kind of continued on a tradition of the last live stream of the month. 
that that live stream would last for about two hours and then we would migrate to a Zoom meetup so that, you know, people could talk and interact with each other. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, and as I mentioned before, it's just, I look forward to it every month. It's always like really fascinating conversations. What, what gear people have gotten, you know, what they got that was terrible, what they got that was great, what they loved, you know, and just, you know, how to get through different situations. We may occasionally answer questions, but we will always be doing the live streams, um, you know, we may take a break for Thanksgiving in November. We may miss one, but in the, for the U.S., it's, it's a holiday. But, you know, we'll continue to do the live streams on Tuesdays and Fridays unless I'm traveling specifically or it's a holiday or there's a trade show I'm involved with. All right, so we see from uh, Wilfried, uh, this is new shop, have a total poor design is not compatible with iPad Pro 11. So I, you know, I'm not sure if a lot of times if you're, you know, um, you know, I think most people would be buying from their computer. So I haven't tried it with the iPad Pro 11, but I think, you know, most people would be purchasing through, uh, through their computer so that you could download directly onto your system. So I think that's really more the design intention and, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, I know that there's some times if you buy through the app store on Apple that get to pay 30% of all the money to Apple. So I don't think we would want to do that. Like you can't buy a Kindle book, you know, from, from an iPhone or an iPad, you have to buy it from the website uh, because I, I think, you know, with some things, if you buy it, from an iOS device that you, since it's restricted to only the Apple store, I think it might be where, you know, Apple would, you know, realize revenue from that, you know, so, so that could be the reason why. All right. So we have Jammin and Cannon who's just joined. Hope you didn't miss anything big. You could always rewatch. So. All right, so we see Keith Young. Uh, one more question, please, Greg. So you could ask as many as you want. Um, is there a limit to the number of plugins on a track before you start running into trouble? Thanks. You know, I sometimes I you know I you know it could really depend upon your system and you know the plugins that you're using. So some plugins can be very CPU efficient, and you can run lots of them, and some may not be designed to be run CPU efficient. Uh, realize that if you have 16 inserts on one particular track that often that one track may be utilizing one CPU core. So you could sometimes put 16 tracks, 16 inserts, like heavy inserts on one single track. And then, you know, when you go to play, your audio performance may be just totally killed. And you look at the performance in the performance meter in the operating system it's like it's not utilizing the other cores that i have and that's because it's kind of one process of one audio track and it can't split those up to different cpu cores so you know there's always going to be some issues like that that can arise i would say you know that in modern computers we could run lots and lots and lots of plugins if you run into problems you could freeze you know particular plugins you could you know there's lots of different options so it's, it's hard to give an exact number of you know plugins you know because 16 plugins from one company may be a lot less cpu efficient than 16 plugins from a, a, a different company but you can run a lot of processing um, and you know but sometimes you know i see people that are running like you know, a separate compressor for one particular word and they have nine compressors all running at once and they kind of carve the frequency response. Um, so at a, at a certain point, I think it gets to be counterproductive and that could be a personal opinion of mine. 
but you know if it makes it sound great for you we're happy all right so we have a question from black lung thanks for joining the live stream um Uh, I have several VE Pro instruments, each with its each with 16 MIDI channels. I'm using 16 stereo outs with the different MIDI channels assigned to the different outputs. Uh, is there any way to set up when I select a MIDI channel on track that I'm working on the output channel that the MIDI channel is assigned to on the mixer moves to it like the instrument track does? So, you know, realize that the, a MIDI track itself doesn't necessarily have the information within a MIDI track to associate the output. So there's no way for, you know, and it's just the nature of MIDI. And that's one of the benefits of working with a particular instrument track is that when you select it, that the, you know, the audio component will be selected as well. But, you know, MIDI tracks don't, you know, and the MIDI information you know, once we are sending MIDI out, we send the MIDI out, but, you know, the MIDI track itself doesn't know where the audio for that source is going to be generated. So it won't automatically select MIDI tracks like it does instrument tracks. I know that could be problematic if you have, you know, 160 tracks going on. But, you know, consider maybe if you could migrate to instrument tracks. Gerald Evie likes to Homer Simpson easy concept. It was my, it was always my long-standing way to get features put in. You know, of telling Germans that we had to make it for, you know, think of Homer Simpson, and I go, oh, you're right. Okay, it has to be Homer Simpson obvious. That's what I used to say. All right, so we see Benny just says a question, uh, just a question. I hope that Cubase 13 has three licenses as well. So I don't, I wouldn't anticipate any changes to the licensing system. So. Okay, so we see Jeff Sabelski uh, says, Greg, my product shows Cubase 12, Specularis Pro 9, Dorco, Elements 4, but not Nuendo, which appears, which opens, not WaveLab 11, WaveLab 10 opens. Uh, last week, attempted activation code uh, for WaveLab 11, different format. Um, so, you know, let us know, you know, uh, Jeff, which version of Nuendo. So it's going to be Nuendo 12, not Nuendo 11. And, um, you know, and check, you know, if you have also, if you want to send me screenshots of your, uh, if you have vouchers or your Steinberg activation manager, uh, and you could send those to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de, I'd be happy to take a look at them for you. All right, wonderful to see Jay from uh, Secret Studios on. Glad you can make it today. And he was also granted one gallon of strawberry cheesecake ice cream. So I guess uh, our metric system attendees will have to share what the equivalent of one gallon is in, in the metric system for Michael Teens in case but it's it's very generous so All 
All right, so we see Mr. Fleskness uh, says, I really like the positive atmosphere in these sessions and Greg's deep knowledge and endurance to answer all types of questions. We'll get to the bottom of the input thing. You know, so realize that, you know, you just have to tell, you know, like what source is going to be fed into the channel. It's like if you have a particular, you know, like you have to pair a Bluetooth mouse or a Bluetooth keyboard with your computer so it doesn't work with every computer, you know, so... I think once you get it down, it, you know, you don't have to worry about it much. But there's a lot of concepts when starting off. But And again, thanks for joining the live streams. All right, always so wonderful to see Tiago checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see um, Secrets, J for Secret Studios. Uh, hi, Greg, are Nuendo and Cubase MIDI 2.0 compatible? I've been looking at some MIDI controllers, but don't know if the display sort of controllers will auto-populate variable names from Steinberg. Uh, so, you know, we're still kind of waiting for stuff to happen on the MIDI 2.0 front, but obviously we probably have a new version coming. So, you know, when a new version is released, you might be able to get some additional information. So I think, you know, there's MIDI 2.0 controllers uh, that are out, um, you know, that could have like, you know, such increased resolution, uh, you know, like Native Instruments has their recent controllers. Korg, I think, just announced a new MIDI 2.0 controller. Uh, that can transmit the MIDI, but there's still not a lot of instruments that actually support MIDI 2.0, especially in the hardware realm. So there's controllers coming, so we'll just have to wait and see as hardware develops. All right, so we see Gerald Ely just commented. Uh, he tested store, doesn't re request a password, just your email. Got my items without a problem, but you can't put more than one item in the cart at a time. That's a bummer. All right, I'll, I'll pass along that feedback. All right, so we see from Keith Young, I uh, hope this makes sense. Uh, how do I add another stereo out track to use as a master and have that track appear just before the stereo out? Thanks. So what a lot of people do is they will take um, all of the tracks. So we'll take this example here. So all of our tracks in this project are going to be feeding into our stereo out. But what I want to do is what a lot of people will do is if you wanted to like, you know, create a scenario where you could do printing of different things. So I'm going to select my different tracks here. So let's say Okay, and then I'm going to right click and we'll say uh, group channel to selected channels. So we could call this kind of like a pre master group. So now all of my tracks are feeding, you can feed my pre master. I didn't take the effects channel, but. So, and now, so you can build your template so everything is going into the pre-master group, and then that group then goes into the master. So, you know, so that's an easy way of just take sending everything to a particular group, and we could also do that through direct output as well. So another method would be to come here. Uh, I'll revert this just to make it even like a little simpler and where we don't have to use an effects end. So if we go to our 
large mixer, we can activate our direct routing. And then let's say we want to take all of our groups. We're going to add a group track. Let's say here, we'll call this our pre-master. And I could select all of my tracks. And then we could send these to our pre-master group. If I had Q-Link turned on, that would help. So now we could do it to all the tracks are now going to our pre-master group. So at that point, everything is being bussed out to this group. And then you could have the pre-master group right before the stereo out and kind of have like a duplicate source. And you could do processing there if you needed to as well. All right, so we see Mode Furtif asks, uh, hello, Greg, thanks for your support. I'm sorry for my English. Well, I'm sorry that I only speak English. Uh, I have a question for you. I would like um, to comping piano, audio, and MIDI together, left hand and right hand separately. Okay, so let's take just a source. Um, See if it's in my yeah. Let's take this. We'll take just solo piano. All right. So let's say we have a piano part here. Okay, so let's say I want to take everything C2 below and put that um, into another track. So let's just come over here, I'll add MIDI track. Okay, so I will Okay, so I'm gonna take all these notes, cut all right, I'm just gonna Okay, so we have like left hand and right hand here. So this is our right hand or left hand and this will be right hand and together. Let me paste this at origin, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so we have this set up. Um, so I'd like to comping piano, audio, and MIDI together, left and right hand separately. Okay, so let's say I want to 
take this and I'll just render in place. Okay, let me just not have them mute it. my settings there, sorry. Okay, so now if I wanted to group these together, I could hit Control G and group these together and hit Control G so that we could take the audio and the MIDI. So if I want to cut I could just come over here, cut the left and right hands and keep the MIDI and audio aligned. So if I cut the MIDI, the audio is cut because those two events are going to be grouped together. So let me know if that's what you want to do. Um, if not, you know, just, just let me know. But that's how you could kind of, you know, do editing of both MIDI and audio simultaneously. All right, wonderful to see Sable Winters on the live stream. Glad you can make it today. Always better when Sable's on. All right, so we see maybe a further clarification. It says I put MIDI and audio in a folder, and I select the option group for comping audio, no problem. But with the MIDI, it's working wrong. You know, so you know, let me know if that kind of makes sense. But if you're doing, um, you know, so if that would work, but you know, realize that depending how the MIDI is recorded. So let's say if I'm here. And I'll just revert. All right, so let's say I'm punching in here. And when we punch in, All right, so, and depending on your MIDI record mode could also be set up the same way. So when you go into uh, your MIDI record mode, you could say, okay, do you want to merge or replace? But if you're in cycled, you could also do uh, stacked recording. So let's say I want to do just a quick recording of this. All right, and then we'll go back. So now when we want to look at our different lanes, here we could see our lanes and grab the comping tool to choose exactly which part that we want to work with. So you could comp the MIDI, but it could really be dependent upon which record mode you're in. So if you go to like stacked or new parts, you could just, depending if you're in cycle record, then you could comp the MIDI in the same way as you would an audio performance. All right, so we have uh, Chikandi Natata from Malawi. Thanks for joining us. You might be our first attendee live. 
to introduce themselves from Malawi. Thank you so much for being on. Okay, Lars asks, uh, what happens routing wise when I send a track to two group channels? Thank you. Okay, so when we have our track that's going to two group channels, it's basically they're both going to be sent in parallel to the group channels. So we'll come over here. Let's take uh, our little audio drum loop here. Get this project activated. So we'll solo this and All right, let me make sure I don't have. All right, so we have this and we look at our mixer. So now I'm going to add two group channels. We'll make them stereo. All right, so now. When we come here, we're going to go to my sends and we'll say, okay, we're going to send it to group two and to group three. And now we can see that these are going to be going directly in parallel to the two sources. So it's an insert effect will generally, you know, go from this insert feed the next signal chain into the next signal into the next plugin into the next plugin kind of in in series so this will be going sequentially but when we're sending it through sends to groups at this point we are just sending this and we're kind of duplicating its output signal out of this group and this group and then we could do all sorts of wonderful parallel processing if you need it to Okay, so we see from uh, Home Studio World, um, and we see Greg, uh, I mean, from pre-gain, let stems have the same input gain with shortcut or using logical editor. And I think this was like with the stems. Um, so and I, I think this is where we kind of showed before that we could you know, take these and normalize those particular events. Um, you know, so if you are recording through, you know, if you needed to adjust the gain, um, you know, so let's say if I wanted to, like I have this track feeding this source here, and let's say I add an audio track and I want group two to be its input. So we will continue to play this. All right, now as soon as I come here, so we could attenuate the input volume from, so as we do this, the audio channels input is adjusted so if I turn this down we see that the input to the audio channel so if you need pre-gain if you're doing something like if you're sending it to groups you could adjust the amount of the group that is being fed to the audio channel itself so let me know if that's helpful or if you have like maybe explain the whole scenario again um, so I could uh, have more context with it Everyone's happy that Sable's on. Um, so we see from Chikandi Natata, uh, can you do full mixing for 
acapella songs i mean you could obviously do it in cubase i you know i have like a vocal file that someone had sent um i'm not sure if it's so copyright friendly to play but you know i don't i don't know the you know the chords i mean you could obviously do it in cubase i don't have like a file prepared to really do it but you know you could determine you know the chords and kind of build upon the chords uh, but there's no kind of automatic, you know, here's my vocal, come up with a backing track AI type of functionality. You'd probably have to create it. All right, so we see from uh, Jammin and Canon, uh, any suggestions on tutorials for Spectral Ears 1? Uh, having problems on a live recorded guitar track with a lot of bleed through. Uh, I'm kind of lost for learning Spectral Ears. So there are tutorials on Spectral Ears, and it might be under the, uh, like, Steinberg, uh, just not the Cubase YouTube channel, but there's a kind of, you know, YouTube channels for Nuendo, Wave Lab, Instruments, Dorco, and then for other Steinberg products, and I think you'd see some in there. Uh, let me see if we can find, you know, s some of the more advanced versions of Spectral Layers will allow you to be able to take a, you know, one source, like you say, okay, the symbols are bleeding into the drums, and then you could use the symbols as the basis to extract those particular parts from a recording but I don't think that's in spectral layers one uh, but let's see if we can find something that's kind of uh, appropriate here so I'll just so this I'll pan it in the center roughly Alright, so we will take this uh, part and we'll launch it into, and I have the pro version, so I, you know, so I may have more options than are available, you know, but if you wanted to kind of just, you know, think of this again as, you know, we're almost taking this waveform and kind of flipping it, you know, like, 90 degrees if you will so we're kind of looking at the inside and we see the low notes high notes so say we had a little squeak in there um, so now if we wanted to just you know, find these particular layers. So there is, uh, and I think that, um, like the magic wand selector that you could kind of just take, like, you know, these particular frequencies there and like, you know, hit delete. And be able to kind of get rid of some stuff like that, you know, just be able to, you know, take those particular frequencies and be able to kind of get rid of different elements like that, you know. So sometimes, you know, using kind of the different selection tools and as we look at different components here, you know, but there is kind of a function in the pro version where you could, you know, basically find a particular, um, it might be under process, but you could do like D bleed and you could take like the basis of one audio track. So let's say the guitar is bleeding into the vocals. You could then select the guitar track and, and say, okay, take this part and the, that's bleeding into the vocal mic and then take out the guitar from the vocal and use that. But I'm not sure if that's in spectral layers one though but just to kind of show you some of the other stuff that you could do with it. So now if you want to listen to this. So you can get rid of squeaks and stuff like that pretty easily.
right? So we're just seeing from uh, from uh, mode for if it says no with lanes uh, for the MIDI comping. So let me know if like the comping I did with the MIDI, uh, if that makes sense for you. But you don't have to put it into a group track, but you know the record mode could be critical for that to function. All right, so we see, you know, from mode, for it says uh, thanks, and is it possible for MIDI? So let's see if we can get this kind of set up. Which is good to, I think we have a piano part already. Okay, so we'll come over here and I'll just do a short comp of MIDI and audio. So we'll have our MIDI. I'm going to send this to group channel. Then Okay, so it's going to group one. And let's go ahead and create an audio track. With group one as our input. Okay, so we'll come here. I'll just put it into like a cycle record. Okay, and let's say while we're in cycle record, I'm going to put this into stacked. Okay. All right, let me just set up a longer record mode here. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up the lanes for these. Okay, let me just adjust my vertical height here. I'll just lose it. Okay, so I don't Let's see if we group these together. Okay, so take this and let's see if we group. So, you know, the audio in MIDI is not going to be, you know, not going to be comped together, you know, but as soon as you, let's, I'll select both tracks here.
but you know I would I would probably do um, you know I don't know a lot of people that work I you know what I would do is say okay well, I want you know this and now I take all of my comps that have been done in in MIDI and then I would just come over to a render in place and then just have that comped you know just for the particular MIDI event but you know it's kind of it's I don't know of a way to comp both the MIDI and audio but you know I'm not sure you know if you benefit from having the audio if you're going to be comping the MIDI because at that point you would just do the comp in the MIDI domain and then render it to audio so it could be just unnecessary if you know to have to do the comp in two different places so in realize that the MIDI comping is going to be slightly different paradigm than the audio comping so maybe just comp the MIDI if needed and then render the file that's how I would approach it Okay, value asks question. Uh, is there a way to have all plugin folders open when trying to insert one? Like all the folders like EQ, compression, showing all the effects, not having to open these folders every time. Thanks, Greg. All right, so let's say if we're here and we go to our inserts. Um, so we see this and we see this big list. Just click on the plus sign here. You could open and close all of them just like that. So this way you don't have to open multiple ones. You could just close them all, open them all. So let me know if that works for you value. And that will work in just about any of the screens. Right, great to see the Heartbreak Time Machine, and he's, he was happy to be the 111th like. So thanks for being online with us. All right, great to see Jazzy Lamel on. All right, wonderful Graham Witcher could make it from Royal Wooten Bassett. see well, Graham's just getting over COVID so hope that it was a mild case and you have a full recovery and Michael Teams is generously granted one gallon of pure medicinal chocolate ice cream to Graham All right, so we see value says, um, I always get a crash dump because of the UR extensions of my UR 22C. Tried updating, reinstalling, and firmwaring. How to solve, I can't really work because it always gives me a failure window. Um, so if you want to email me a crash dump, I'd be happy to pass it along for you. Uh, but you know, let me know also if you're running on Mac or Windows, that information could be helpful. Okay, so we have uh, Jazzy Lamel asks, uh, Blessings, Greg, can you explain some tips and tricks using the line tool? Okay, so let's say um, we want to use the line tool. So the line tool could be used in a lot of different areas. So let's start off and say, okay, I just, like we had shown earlier in the live stream, uh, someone wanted to do like a straight linear fade out on like a reverb effect send or you know instead of having to do the perfect fade out that was so you know linearly smooth with your finger or your mouse you could just kind of draw in with the particular line tool 
Um, so that's a great use. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that there are several different modes for the line tool. So if you wanted to come over here and put in parabolas, we could just come over here and and if we want to hold down modifier keys, we could go the opposite direction. So if I hold down control or command, we could do that. If we want to um, kind of change the spacing. So let's say I want to put in a parabola um, that's two bars long. If I hold down the shift, I can say, okay, I want my parabola to be like, this long like you know so we could change the frequency of the parabola as well and if we wanted to come over and look at you know if we had like a synth filter we could say okay i wanted to come here and kind of mimic lfos so we could say okay now i just want a sine wave and as i hold down the shift key we could change the frequency so if i want it to be like you know two per bar or if I wanted one per bar I could just kind of start here with the shift and as you know hold down the shift key and we say now I want it to be taller and hold down the shift key say okay we want one cycle per or two cycles per bar and then I could just extend that over we could also switch to be different, you know, if I want to do triangle waves instead. So I could come here and put in triangles or square waves. So as we zoom in, so again, you can just do uh, lots of stuff like that. So again, if we say, okay, I want to increase the height, but hold down the shift key to change the frequency you know, all that stuff. So you could switch between different modes. Uh, if you're in a MIDI editor, one of the things that's kind of interesting, a lot of people don't know if you want to do more kind of algorithmic, you know, or random compositions, you could just grab the line tool here. And if we grab the paintbrush, you could just draw in MIDI notes. Um, I think also if we grab the line tool if we want to put a bunch of notes in quickly we could go straight across and put in notes all of the same pitch so if you want to put in like you know um let's say i'll just do a new event here i think this will just snap to our snap values let's say we have this set to quarter notes but now we could select our line tool and just drag across and we could just put in quarter notes just kind of that easily. So if you want to do quick drum programming, you can just quickly add different notes. Um, so that, and once you get into your controller data uh, in the MIDI editors, we could come over here and say, okay, I want to go to my MIDI editor and this is where you could get into a lot of like filters where we could just add filters in not for in the velocity range uh, but you could you know simulate different LFO type of functions again just come over here and just say okay draw in our MIDI CC data to repeat and create kind of LFO patterns that way so a couple things you could do Jazzy Lamel So I think I just see an email coming in from DL White with a mystery reverb. All right, so we see, uh, thanks, Greg, but to set it as default is not possible. Um, so I, I think this is on the uh, 
inserts or like to set the effects. I don't know of a way to have it automatically expanded. Um, but I think it's still faster than opening, you know, one or two. Yeah, it's still faster than opening multiple ones. Let me see if there's a key command out of curiosity. see a key command for that you just look for all right we'll try this um, Expand, reduce. So it's just option E. I don't know if this will work. No, it doesn't seem to. Yeah, so I don't know of a default way of doing that, but I could pass that along as a potential feature request. But I don't think it's so hateful to, you know, it's, it's faster than opening up two, two categories. You see Jamin Cannon says, thanks, Greg. Looks like I'm going to have to upgrade. So. Okay, so we see Uno Memento says, um, I tried a tempo detection and su you suggested on MIDI drums, but I couldn't get it to work properly. Maybe I misunderstood. Can we try it again? Um, it's about synchronizing to freely play drums to beats when Cubase's tempo is 120 and to play drums are around 130. All right, so just do bring a new project here. So I'm going to set my metronome roughly to 130. Okay, I'm going to do a count in. Let me just set my time back here. So now let's say we listen to our drums. All right, so I'm going to now, let's just put it at 120. And let's say I go back to 130, you know, just go down to 100. So it's more obvious of a change. So let's say 100. All right, so let's say if we go back to, and 
let's say at this point, if I want to quantize the drums, um, I'll just quantize it to eighth notes. And let's put on, let's say at 100 beats a minute, and we'll put our metronome. So, and at times you may, you know, like just looking at it, um, you know, another approach is, let's say you're in the editor, you know, if it's fluctuating a lot, so you could now just come over here, grab the time warp tool. So let's just grab our time warp tool and I'll say measure two starts right at there, measure three. say okay okay so now we have our like subtle tempo changes here all right so now at this point let's you know, so let's say if I wanted to change the tempo now, and let's make it instead of changing tempo, let's see what happens if we go to 120. So, and if we started this whole process, let's say, back to 130 beats a minute and we'll just kind of our origin tempo freely played so instead of having to do that we'll go to our tempo detection so project tempo detection Let's see if I have just that one selected. So, you know, if the tempo detection doesn't work as expected, just do the, um, you know, just do the time warp. You do manual time warp. Uh, and then, you know, as you change the tempo, then it will, will fall in line. Right, we see value. Just uh, visit the Opera House modeled in the Reverence plugin. So. And you see, I get the crash dump from value. Thanks for sending that over. Okay, so we see Mark Rabin says never use a line tool. So I like to learn to use it.
Right, so DL White says, uh, Hi again, Greg. I downloaded the old Groove Agent 4 that I had purchased, and now Groove Agent SE5 shows no license found. Uh, is there a conflict with the content installed by each? Can they both be used on the same system? So they should be, you know, we, like I could have uh, Groove Agent, um, you know, so when we I come over here, you know, let's say if I go to add a VST instrument, you know, I have the full Groove Agent and Groove Agent SE. Uh, but when you say the con, you say uh, Groove Agent SE5 shows no license found. So, you know, Groove Agent SE5 comes with Cubase 12, or I think since Cubase 10 or 9, 9.5, something like that. That's when the SE5 was included. So the license is found for the plugin. Let me know if you have problems running the uh, plugin. Like starting the plugin, or you get a license message when you try to load a Groove Agent SE5 kit. Um, but let me know that. But you, you should be able to use both of them simultaneously. But some content may require a different license. All right, so we see Gerald Ely says line tool is my tip of the day. Uh, and Michael Teams it says revelation of the day, the line tool. All right, wonderful to see Steve Allen from UK. Uh, it says, hi, Greg and all. Uh, question, making custom instruments for theater production using Halion 7. Can I install Halion SE for them to use, or will they need the full version as in contact I've used in the past? So if they have just the... Uh, Halion Sonic S, the, just a Halion Sonic SE, or what's you know now the Halion Sonic is like a free player, so they could just use that to play back any of the Halion content. So, all right. So we see Michael Pierce on from Grand Chapel Studios says went to see. Hanaya Rani at the Roundhouse in London last night. Incredible venue. Wonderful chat with the amazing engineer after two. She was generous with her time. We both wanted an H3000. So it's kind of a classic, classic piece of outboard processing gear. All right. So we see. Um, Question, Greg, do you have some insider knowledge when Steinberg is going to have the problems fixed with the online shop and finally will roll out Cubase 13? Uh, so the online shop is up and running as of today. Um, so it's kind of a staged uh, process um, just to make sure everything is functioning. So there's kind of a very limited engagement for like an invite only to test. And now the online shop is fully active and we're seeing how everything is going before there is a huge stress load of perhaps a new version coming soon. Um, so I do probably, I know when the version is coming. Uh, I'm not eligible to say I would be violating a non-disclosure agreement with that. So, um, but it's, it's soon. So, you know, but it's, we want to make sure you know, like add before everything, you know, and it's a pretty miraculous feat within about a month to transition a whole online shop. And we're just doing subtle tests, you know, just to make sure that it's going to work with every character in every country and the financial reporting, the collection, the taxes that are paid to each country. It's a big uh, process. So it's going ahead of schedule. So you know, but the online shop is open. It's currently selling Cubase 12. I could probably assure you that if you got if you bought Cubase 12, that you'd be eligible for a grace period update at this point. Just pure speculation on my part. Let's see, Graham Witcher's just saying, "Yep, the line tool is really fantastic." All right, so we see Michael Teams this is granted Michael Pierce uh, one gallon of Texas two-step ice cream. Such a good choice. All 
right? So we see DL White, uh, this is download assistant shows Groove Agent SE5, not installed. So, you know, if you install that and, you know, when you go to the download assistant, you go from the Cubase, you know, if you go into your My Products and go to Cubase 12, you know, install the Groove Agent SE5 from there, and that should help. All right, so we see um, from the Lunatic Voice, greetings, one question. Is there a way for a piano, for example, to sound real, even if you're not a keyboard player? Make it sound natural. Thank you very much. So one of the things that's always problematic with um, realism in pianos, you know, like sustain pedal, you know, being able to draw in sustain pedal information is important. But, you know, velocities, uh, to make sure that the velocities are kind of working as expected. So let me just go back to this example. Here's kind of a solo piano. I'll revert project. You know, so let's look at like the dynamics on the velocity here. Um, so velocity is really critical, like MIDI drums, same idea. So we'll look at just our piano voicings here. All right, so as we... how those notes kind of pop out and you can see how like we'll have some velocity contours softer then a little arc up and down so let's say I want to take that, that same phrase and I wanted all the velocities to be the same and this is another good use of the line tool. So let's grab my line tool here and I'm just going to make all these velocities pretty much the same level. Versus Like velocities will make a big difference, you know. So like people will on pianos, I know people do like, you know, like solo MIDI piano pieces, and you know they live and die, and they know wh what the velocity point is when it switches like a sample layer. So you know, paying attention to velocities and to you know the sustain pedal, being able to enter that information in can make something sound very realistic versus something that's kind of programmed. So it could take something from a state that's programmed to a state that, wow, this is really musical and, you know, a joy to listen to. Chatfield just jumped. OK, 
Okay, so I'm back to where I was. I'm just reading through comments. All right, so we see Jazzy Lamel asks, Hey, Greg, uh, are there any issues with compatibility issues with Windows 11 and Intel i9 processors running Cubase 12 or 13? So with um, currently, you know, Windows 11, there's no problems with um, if you're running an i9 processor and it's a hybrid processor, it's not going to fully take advantage of the, you know, and the hybrid processors basically have, uh, you know, capabilities where there's efficiency cores, where some of the cores are slower and, you know, meant to do particular tasks and other cores are faster and can handle that. Um, so I think it's that's been kind of recently res resolved in kind of a Windows 11 update. I could be mistaken on that. Uh, but it, it's not going to take advantage of the hybrid CPU cores. Um, but I think that that might be resolved through an OS update. So I think you're going to be in good shape. All right, Mark Padilla, Padilla asks, uh, can you answer a question? How do I turn on rewire? So rewire was discontinued by propeller heads who created it. So it's kind of abandoned technology by them. So it's no longer available to be used. It's and basically it's not going to work on like Apple Silicon processors. So it's never going to be updated to work on that. It's probably not going to be updated to work in future versions of windows. So that's why it's kind of been dropped by the industry. Um, because the, you know, the company that created, you know, I guess Reason Studios now, formerly Propeller Heads, I think, um, that you could, um, you know, basically at this point, you know, it's kind of been abandoned by them. So you could reach out to Reason Studios. Yo, White says, hit the likes, the likes, the likes. Great. I see Mark just saying, yeah, it's a drag about rewire. So, yeah, it is. All right, so we see Michael Pierce will be back up sharing soup recipes, which I always enjoy seeing. All right, so we see, uh, can Cubase make audio files for Spotify or should I use WaveLab? You know, so either program could output to the different uh, file formats. Um, so and you could, you know, have Cubase automatically export and you can normalize it to, you know, minus 14 LUFs. So either program will do that. Let's see some discussion of Mark Rabin and Michael Pierce about Daniel Lenoir. So I, I got to go to his studio once in uh, New Orleans in the French Quarter. That was, that was pretty cool. He had kind of old, it was just in his kind of old haunted house. And, you know, he had an old API console. And I think he had the tannoys, like big, huge tannoys that um, that Revolver was mastered on. He had in his studio. So I didn't get to meet him, but I got to hang out in his studio. All right, uh, so we see Harry Olive. Uh, good day, Greg. Um, did you like show some controller macros to use, or do you use more for mixing or creation, or VST instruments, or plugins as well? Would love to see a separate video about it if you like. Um, so I've done a lot of different. Um, I, I kind of use controllers for all of those things, and that's kind of the great thing. 
Uh, so let's say if I go to my MIDI remote and I have um, I'll just set up a scenario here. Let's see if I may have a project that's kind of suited for it. So let's say like, you know, we have a controller here. So, you know, one of the things that you could do is just create, you know, like let's say I have a limited number of buttons. So I could come over here and we could create uh, mapping pages. So I'll just open up a project and let's say like I want to do like, you know, something you see on live sound consoles. It's kind of an interesting concept is a flip sends to fader. So I will just open up project all right and so I kind of recreated this using the MIDI remote um, so let's say I want to add an effect send to all of these so I'm gonna go to my sends we activate Q link and I want to put just a, a bad reverb we'll just put like a a healthy reverb that most people wouldn't use. Okay, so let's say I have like too much reverb on the drums here. All right, so what I did is I created, um, so if I go to my MIDI remote, I made just a plugin setting and I'll show you kind of what I did. So I just said, we're gonna flip, um, send one flip to fader, right? So each one of the faders now, we can set it up in banks of eight so that instead of this controlling volume, once I've loaded up this mapping page, I could come over and say, okay, we're gonna go to, I think it's gonna be under mix console, mixer bank zone, action, you know. So we could come over here to channels, we go to channel one, kick, and you know, we could set how many faders I have. And I say, okay, let's go to my send slots. I go to slot one, I could say, okay, let's, set the level for slot one. And I could do this for each of my different faders. So once I do this, I could now use my faders here and we go look at our mix console. I could now be controlling just the send levels on the faders. So let's say I have eight faders I'm playing and let's say I'll just kind of solo the tracks so we could have this be completely dry. Now when I move my MIDI remote one, it's dry and I bring the fader up and now I'm controlling send one. So as I want to get to send two, so maybe I want less reverb on the sub kick, maybe no reverb, so send three. So I could as I do these, these eight channels, we'll now just, I could control these independently. So I'll just solo the folder here. And then if I need to control, so I have eight faders, so I'm adjusting my eighth fader and I have buttons where I could turn on the send and I could also flip from peak pre to post fader. So if I want to bring down all of my reverb on these channels or bring them up, so I could do the first eight. Then I could assign, since I defined it as being eight faders, I have like the next bank. So I have this button and when we look at the next bank, we'll just come back to the mixer. I hit the bank button. Now I'm doing channels nine through 16. So, and then 
previous bank, I'm doing channels one through eight. So instead of having to utilize, you know, I could just come here and say, let's just take all the drums. I'll just fast forward just a little bit here. And I want to bring in the effects, okay, just like I would on a console. So maybe I want on this snare. And then, okay, I want to go to my room mics, hit the bank button, and now I can take the overheads and be able to just dial in the reverb. So, and I also hit buttons on the MIDI remote. So if I want it to come over here, I could hit this button on a remote and this would take me to, to send two, to flip send two, to flip send three, send four, send five, six, seven, eight. So I could just, you know, from one controller, go through all of my, you know, re all my effect sends and set the levels through the MIDI remote. And basically what these are, I set up different MIDI mapping pages. And these buttons will now switch to dedicated MIDI mapping pages. So we come over here and we say, okay, let's go to the mapping page actions. And I say that button just goes to sends two flip to fader, sends three flip to fader. So I could control all my effect sends and all my tracks just using this controller very fast. And again, you know, it's a $79 controller. It just has, you know, eight faders, 24 buttons, eight knobs, transport, a bank button. So just really, you know, so those are some of the creative things you could do when using, you know, MIDI remote that, you know, could often be overlooked. Okay, so we see um, error happens, this is from DLY, error happens when I load a kit. Uh, may I be loading a kit from four, may the track has SE5, the error is only after I install Groove Agent 4 paid version. So it could be, you know, th there might be some kits that are included with Groove Agent 4 that aren't uh, compatible you know, depending on a kit in Groove Agent 4. So let me know if you load the kit into Groove Agent 4 or you get the mess the error message just to DL White when you load the kit from Groove Agent 4 into uh, Groove Agent SE. And if it is one of the standard kits, you have the acoustic agent and the beat agent, or if it's a third party kit that you're loading up. So we see uh, Michael Pierce is just about the online store. In the UK, they keep saying tax isn't hard. I would like to disagree. That goodness knows what the online world has to deal with. Yeah, so it's you know different taxes and revenue recognition for the online store. So it gets to be very complicated. So, And if that company that's doing our online store that we're partnering with, if they needed a DAW, they would probably reach out to us because that's what we do. Okay. So Sable Winter says, wow, what a difference in that piano. So yeah, just tweaking velocities can make a, you know, just a big difference. You know, it's all those little details add up to, you know, stuff that just makes sounds, you know, makes things sound a lot more musical. All right, so we have a question from, uh, it says, hey Greg, I know how to switch the sample rate on Cubase. So it, um, to do it, you could go to your project menu to project setup, and you could do it on the project level, and then you could just switch your sample rate here. So, or you could hit shift plus the letter S, like project setup, and you could adjust your sample rate here, the bit depth, and what type of audio file that you format you want to record in.
right, so we see Stella like the piano song. That's good. All right, so we see for the Heartbreak Time Machine, uh, is there a 5.1 template in the Cubase Hub presets? I don't think that there is one. Um, but, you know, if, you know, let me know if you have a problem creating one. So, but, you know, basically you could add a 5.1 output. So, you know, to do it, just add probably as your primary monitor, go to your audio connection, set your outputs here to 5.1 instead of stereo so you know maybe makes sense to have um so it's good to add a bus we'll add a 5-1 and as we add our 5-1 we could make that the main output i don't have so we'll right click and we could choose this as our uh, main mix and then also you could create a monitor and when you go to the control room set up a one of your monitors uh, instead of it being stereo you want to set that up to 5.1 so when we I'll just remove this monitor and let me add a monitor and then we could just choose this to be 5.1 and that way all of your surround will be working so all right so we have a question uh hi greg is there a way to humanize midi playback for piano i've seen this in other apps and thought i saw it in cubase some years ago so yeah there's a number of different ways of doing it so uh we'll go back to or piano so let's say we you know played something in and we we're just kind of showing uh just what you could do just with the velocity so the velocity can be used to humanize you know quite easily so let's say everything here is fixed velocity and we'll go back to our control room so let's say as we listen to it here. So if we, there's a number of ways of doing it. So if we just go to our MIDI modifiers, we can say we want to randomize velocity. And we can say like up, So like as we listen to this, instead of it playing straight back. Even just kind of a total random thing. And then if I wanted to apply that, I think I could just go to my freeze MIDI modifiers and we could see the result of the velocity changes on the events. So without that turned on, so all the same velocity. And we'll kind of even go a little more extreme under velocity. see the changes of that setting apply to it we could just come right over here freeze the MIDI modifiers and that way you could just where it's all kind of now boring now I could just turn this on and on playback you could hear the difference and you could also randomize the position. So we could say, okay, let's just take the position and randomize that a little bit as well. So now the notes cannot be like perfectly on the beat or on a grid. So 
So kind of boring, dynamics-wise. And it's probably an extreme on position, but you could, you know, take pitch, velocity, length of notes, and be able to uh, randomize those really easily. So you know, check out the MIDI modifiers. So we see Mark just says, uh, does anyone know when Cubase 13 is coming out? So, you know, usually Steinberg doesn't announce until it's released. So I would have a feeling it's coming pretty soon. So, All right, Jim Fox asks, uh, can one new Windows 12 license be installed on two Windows 10 computers, i.e. one in my studio, one in my home? Someone asked if Cubase can have three installs. Got me thinking. Yeah, so Jim, your uh, Nuendo license can be activated on three different computers. So you could have it at home in your studio, you could have it on a laptop, and at your studio in Maryland. So. All right, so we see uh, from the Heartbreak Time Machine, uh, just said I need to be able to look closely at the sub base and which channels need filters, etc. So yeah, in the surround panner, you know, you could send stuff directly to the LFE channel via send or within the surround panner as well. All right, so we see Phil Emery says, uh, is there any way to use the old style quantize maps from Cubase 3.5? Uh, so if there are the groove quantize, um, I'm not sure. You know, I think we did some of the technology with, um, you know, a company called WC Music Research and they are not no longer in business, but you know, you could, so I'm not sure if they will low up, load up as groove presets or not um you know you can take you know so let's say if we have our uh groove quantize elements here so let's just say just adjust my um so if you have like a cubase 3 so you might be able to load them up as um, quantize presets. I haven't tried this in a long time. So if you, uh, but if you have any of the files from 3.5, you, you know, if it's like the groove templates, uh, what you can do is quantize the event, quantize an event in 3.5, and then just take that particular event here. Uh, and drag it into the quantize and that way you could then save it as a, a new quantize preset so I know that would work so if you still have those and still have access just to put it on some different files you could drag that drag that quantized file to the quantize panel and have it loaded up for you and preserved and make it future proof. So Mark Rabin says, uh, Greg, you went, you went to the corner of Esplanade, Kingsway Studio. So that, that was it. So yeah, Michael Paz took me there. So I don't know if you don't, you may know him, Mark. And his friend Rick, who had a studio in Medieri. He was a big Cubase guy. And that's where I used to do some clinics there. And I remember Art Neville would come out and stuff. So it's always fun. Hang out with art.
just reading through comments. All right, Jazzy Lamel asks, hey, Greg, my client asks me if the loops that are in Cubase are royalty free or will they get flagged if they're in YouTube or some other platform? So uh, they are royalty free to use from Cubase. Sometimes people will write a song and get it copywritten and then it gets flagged in the kind of the uh, AI algorithms. And then, you know, often it's just, you know, sending a letter, you know, this content is fair use as part of the DAW and then it's not an issue. So all the loops and all the content that we offer to sale are free, uh, royalty free. So there's no worries about that. But um, sometimes people use it in a song and then it will get dinged because someone else used a loop and it got released and was kind of procured into their algorithm to check for, but it's pretty easy to take care of. So, but I think there was a, uh, Roland had a, like a, a bass and drums card that uh, I think this is a story I heard that Alanis Morissette used as a loop from that. And that got dinged for copyright and it had to stop selling the unit. No, that was the rumor because he got a copyright violation on a drum loop that was used in it or something like that. Right, so we see a uh, new controller for Cubase soon. So, you know, hopefully our development partners, you know, our team at Yamaha is working on something, but nothing that's been announced. I wish we had one. There's a lot of people want CC121, a new version of that. But with the, you know, figure with the, uh, with the MIDI remote functions in Cubase, you could use you know, so many controllers, you know, much easier. All right, Mark Rabin's dog Stella says, hit the like. All right, so we see, uh, Greg Undo, how in Jumpin' Jellyfish's name do you do that saving the project as? Um, so if you want to save the project, you know, so if we save the project, you know, we, we, you know, we save the project under the given name. If there's no name, you're asked to provide a name. If you do a save as, you could save it uh, with a new name. So if we call this MIDI quantize, we could call this MIDI quantize with edits. So we could be prompted to type in a new name with a save as. If we do a save new version, and let's say we're on to file MIDI, uh, MIDI quantize demo new edits, it would save MIDI quantize file new edits 01, 02, 03. So it'd increment the numbers. If we wanted to back up a project to an entirely different location, so realize that when you save the project, the project, the CPR file, will reference where the audio files are on the system. So if you, but the CPR file itself doesn't contain the audio files. It says, you know, these audio files are being used and the CPR file, you know, so if you get to a point where your audio files are kind of all in different locations on your drive and you need to consolidate, you could go to your media menu and choose to prepare archive, or we could just go to your file menu and do backup project. That will ask you to define a new folder and the new folder will move all the content required into the new folder, leaving everything intact where it was before. So let me know if that is helpful. All right, so wonderful to see Avri from Tel Aviv. We hope you're safe. All 
All right, we see Steinberg MIDI says freeze MIDI modifiers is a feature I most likely use every time I make a track. Okay, so we see from the cart, what does the button on the left of the tempo time do, please? Okay, so this button here, I think maybe it's on the project window. Um, so this activates the tempo track. So let's say uh, in my project, I wanted to have a single tempo. Okay, so I'll just do, Right, so let's say in my project here, I have a single tempo. So I could just have a fixed value here. When this is activated, let's say I can now have my tempo changes. And this tells Cubase to play back the tempo changes as opposed to playing back a steady tempo. So maybe you want to work out an idea with a steady tempo and then uh, do tempo changes to fit a video scene, something like that, or you could now, so this button basically tells Cubase to follow and do multiple changes or to ignore those changes and play a steady tempo value. All right, so we see, uh, can I do a shortcut to spectral layers, to, uh, spectral layers process to audio? So if you have an audio event that you've done spectral layers edits on, so we could go to an ARA extension, but not choose an ARA extension. Uh, but if we go to uh, a particular audio file and we have now done spectral editing on it, so say we come over here and we've now applied our extension to the track. We can come over here, let's say we do spectral layers. You can, once you've done the edits, there are where you could make the track extensions permanent. You could do that via a keyboard shortcut. All right, so we see a uh, question. Greg Undo, could you change the different skin colors? Show me, please. So if I wanted to change, like, you know, backgrounds of different windows, we could come over here, go to your preferences, and you'll see a user interface. And then, like, a lot of times you could come over here and say uh, color scheme. So if I want to change, like, you know, the project background, I want it to be brighter. I could come over here or the editor window background. So if I, let's say I just take the project background. Sorry, let me just jump back. So project area background, I could come over and hit OK. And then, you know, so we're able to change a lot of different. So check out some of these particular settings here and so we could change kind of different elements of the interface like that okay so we see uh why don't i see the grid icon and snap icon in my cubase menu on top so make sure that you, if you go to the setup window, make sure that they are visible. So if you don't see it, make sure that you have like the snap turned on. And if it is checked, it's visible. You might have to come over here to the setup, depending on your screen resolution. 
and we could say, okay, I want to take my snap and we could move it up. And as we move it up in this list, it moves it over to the right. So if I want to move it back down, so make sure that it's going to be visible. You could also have stuff that's anchored to the left or anchored to the right. But sometimes people could load up a lot of different functions there and their screen resolution doesn't allow them to see all of it. So again, make sure that it is active and checked. And then if it's checked, you may have to just kind of change the position of the order. And sometimes some of the functions where you see like three little lines uh, between different functions that could open up some of you know, you can hide and have abbreviated feature sets of functions. So Avery says, I'm a magician. All right, so we have Club Debris checking in from Rio. Thanks for joining us. Let's see, Peter says, Daniel Lenoir grew up about two hours from where he's located outside of Montreal. Okay, so we see from Club Debris the time management question. Is there a way to keep how much tr how much time I spend in a particular project? Cubase 12 Pro, Windows 10. Um, there is a VST plugin. I think it might be HOFA, H-O-F-A, that has a plugin that as soon as you start the program, it will as soon as you're in a project, will keep time of how much you've used, which is nice for billing. But there isn't anything that's included with Cubase to indicate that. But there are, I believe there is a free VST plugin that will allow you to show you how much time you've been in a project. Yeah, so you see Michael Pierce just mentioned the same plugin. All right, so we have a uh, mode for Tiff uh, ask, is it possible to combine the pencil tool and range selection tool? Yeah. Um, so let's say if we have this, I'll make this just a little larger. All right, so we have kind of, you know, two different tool modes. There's the selection tool and a range tool. So and they're very powerful when combined together. So to combine them, we just click on this little icon and we can see that when we're at the top, it's a range tool. When we're at the bottom, it is an object selection tool. So I can move the range. I could undo that. I could come over here. When I go to the top for different, uh, my uh, fade envelopes, we could adjust there when I kind of double click. So once you're below kind of the halfway threshold, it is functioning as an object selection tool. And then once you're above the in the top half it's a range selection tool so you could combine those two all right i know we had uh questions that were mailed in let's get to those where we run out of time thanks for all the wonderful questions All right, first question, Greg, I'm a Cubase 12 Pro user on Windows 10. I'm planning an upgrade to new Windows 11 PC in the near future. What is the best way to transfer all my plugins to the new PC? Can Cubase 12 do, uh, can Cubase 12 Pro produce a printable plugin database, including current file paths that I could use to set up my new machine? All right, yeah, so if you go to the plugin information window, go to studios to VS, it's going to be our VST plugin manager. Uh, and then you have a plugin report. So come over here, let's just click here. We'll save it as a text file. Uh, let's go to my desktop. So 
So here's our plugin report. So we could see, um, you know, our Cubase Pro, which version we're using, uh, plugins that are in the block list, all of the plugins with their paths, the version numbers, their path, all that information included right here. So that way you could go through and find them and just kind of search. So once again, inside of Cubase, go to your um, VST plugin manager, and then you'll see the plugin report directly there at the bottom. Okay, um, I think I'm helping this person already over email. All right. All right, so we have a question, how to adjust clip gain automation from a key command? All right, so if we have a key command, let's say in this event, and we want to adjust our clip gain automation, all we have to do is we can see that we have like, and that's this function. So this is gonna be completely independent of automation. So if we come here, we can see our automation, but if we want it to adjust this, this is gonna be pre-fader before automation. So if we wanted to trigger this from a key command, we'll go to quick MIDI remote. It's I think it's called decrement or increment volume. So let me switch my mapping page. Um, I will come over here and let's just search for, I think it's decrement uh, event volume. Okay, so I'm going to assign this here to this event. And now I want to conversely increment event volume. I'm going to assign that to the knob next to this. So now as I come over here, I could just use my MIDI remote to increment and decrement the, and that does it in intervals of one dB. So we could just come right over here and increment and decrement by one dB with a controller or keyboard shortcut to just make it very easy. And if we want to, you know, come here, let's split, uh, sorry, wrong key command. Now I could just take, now that I've split that event, I could just increment and decrement just that selected range as well. Okay, so we had just a question. Um, hello, Greg, it's about studio strings, instrument and how in six. Uh, according to the example and the link, I would like to change the samples of the yellow menu, insert uh, chamber string spiccato one plus two RR as a third, but it doesn't work. I'd be grateful if you could help me. All right, so I think if we go back, I think I have that loaded up. Okay, so we'll come over here. Let's okay, so let's say we have this particular string patch open. All right, so let's come over here and edit, and we're gonna click on layer one, layer two, layer three. So if we want it to, so this is the one that we want to change. So as soon as, again, so click on edit, not the program, but you can come over here, edit, and then this string patch is comprised of three different voices. So if we want to look at the program, it's gonna be, that voice layered with that. So these three layered together.
We'll make that sound if we wanted to replace one of the instruments. So let's say we go to um, this third layer. At this point, what we could do is say, okay, I want this to be chamber strings pizzicato instead. So now, I want. And you could adjust the volume and panning of each of these independently. So again, just kind of click here on the different layers and then you could choose all of your different string voices for layering right there. All right, so I had a question. Um, wasn't sure if I totally understood from the wording, uh, but the question is how to do structure bars in each number line without missing your line point. Uh, please and thanks. Uh, kind of ask for a clarification. I didn't get it before, but it, I think it might be where you want to see each measure indicated here. So, you know, and this could be based on the level of zoom. So right now we see two measures. And as we zoom in, now we see four measures of time between here. We zoom in, it's eight measures, 16, 32. So it could be just, if you wanted to see the grid for each measure, it could be just related to the actual um, level of the zoom. I think if you're here and you want to see each line, um, that that you know it could just end up being just you know completely white where you're not seeing anything so kind of the zoom will change based upon you know the number of bars are indicated in the divisions if that's what the question is is just kind of related to the zoom level All right, uh, so I had a question. I'm transcribing a Chopin piece, Opus 48, number two. The piece calls for tuplets. Three, it also calls for music to be inputted in the form of tuplets of five and six. Um, how do you input tuplets of five and six or greater into the score editor in Cubase Pro 11? Okay, so triplets, you know, you know, of three, you know, that's, pretty straightforward to do. So let's open up our score editor here. Um, so I'm just going to input some different notes. All right. So let's say if I'm entering it in from the score editor, uh, what we could do is come over and say, um, I'm just going to enable step input. So let's say I want to do quintuplets. So I have my step input turned on. I'm going to uh, let me just set my quantized value here differently. Bear with me just for a second. Okay, so say I just want to do like eighth notes. Okay, and let me just, here, I'll start from, I'll revert this quickly. Okay, so we're 4-4 four, four time, and I want to put in eighth notes, so I'm, as I come over here, I'm just going to put in five notes. Okay, so what I want to do now is to select these five notes. And we see these are kind of like, okay, I have these inputted as eighth notes. We go to our scores menu and we'll see build end tuplets. 
and we can say I want this to be uh, five notes in one beat. So we will now come over here, click on build, and we could have our five notes and let me not select part of the rest. So I'll just So, and if we say we want to do this over, let's say, four or five, five notes into four beats. So we could just come over here and let me just put in the notes one more time. I'll just go back. Okay, so again, select those, but I don't select the rest. Come over here to build end tuplet. And now you could have your quintuplets automatically created. So if I wanted to do it for um, septuplets, like seven notes, Again, I could select the notes, don't select the rest, but select the notes, go to scores to build end tuplet, and we want to make seven notes over two beats, and then you have your septuplets created just like that. All right, another question. Um, I know how to import Cubase's three files into Cubase Pro 11, but how do you export? Cubase Pro files into Cubasis 3 software. So Cubasis 3 is going to be a subset of the features of Cubase Pro 11. So it's not going to include every single plugin. It's not going to include, you know, like the very audio, some of the, you know, so there's a lot of stuff in Cubase Pro 11. It's not in Cubasis. Um, so those functions you know, will allow you to go from the smaller subset of features into the bigger Cubase, uh, but the, all the features in Cubase won't necessarily translate down to the smaller version of Cubasis. So that's why you don't see the export Cubasis, you know, export Cubase to Cubasis, but from Cubasis to Cubase. All right. Let's go back to our live questions. Thanks for sending all the questions in advance. And again, you can send questions to clubcubase at steinberg.de. comments all right so we see um from ernesto rodriguez uh, how can i move the cursor line with the keyboard so i assume it's maybe uh the midi keyboard so try um holding you see the plus and minus keys on the keyboard themselves you can just move the cursor and this is on a numeric keypad so minus plus and then if you wanted to nudge, so let's say we have our snap value here set to bar. So if I'm at measure 11, I could hit control or command and the plus sign, and then we could navigate by bars, forwards. So control command and a plus sign and the numeric keypad, like where the numbers are, and, and command or control uh, with the minus key and then you could navigate the cursor like so or if you want to fast forward rewind if you hold down shift you could increase the wind speed so this is normal rewind fast forward with the plus and minus key with the shift key it's increase speed and then if we wanted to nudge the cursor control or command key with the plus and minus on the numeric keypad.
All right. All right, so we see, um, can you explain how to convert a Groove Agent track to separate audio parts tracks? Thanks. Yeah, so take a look. All right, so if you have, you know, the, the routing is going to be determined, be determined by the routing inside a Groove Agent. So if we come over here, I have a Groove Agent example. Um, so let's say we, as we play this, So currently everything is going out of one output. I open the instrument and let's say I go to the mixer. So I can say I want the kick going out of my main mix, my snare going out of output two, hi-hat out of output three. And let's say my overheads out of output four, my room mics out of output five. So, and so, you know, we could basically bust these out to output so now when I play back this pattern everything is being bust out independently and then all I had to do is I could select a track let's go to your edit menu uh, go to render in place we'll go to the render settings make sure you I think you need the channel settings turned on hit render and then each of the outputs is automatically rendered to their own track just like that All right. Okay, so Spencer B says, uh, is there a way, asks, is there a way to save samples from the sample track that could be stored in maybe the media bay? So if we have a sampler track, let's just come over here. Uh, so we'll go to our sampler. I want to make this. All we have to do now is, you see right here, stored as a preset. We'll save a track preset. We'll come over here and we'll call it October 27, 2023. And now when we go to Media Bay, you know, we could just come over here, say, okay, let's, let's go to Media. We'll jump home and we could go to User Presets track preset sampler and we'll see uh, October 27th and we could just drop that in and play the sample just like that. All right, so with that, we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for spending part of your morning, evening, afternoon, learning more about Steinberg products. Um, again, next Tuesday will be our Zoom social meetup. So we'll have a two hour live stream and then we'll have a special guest, Tim Hinckley. So um, that's going to be, I, you know, he's just a wonderful fountain of knowledge and great stories and insights in production with his just legendary career of almost, you know, 55, 60 years. He's been doing, uh, working, I think it's probably 60 years. I think he started in 63. Uh, so don't miss that. We'll be starting that at 3 p.m. So two hours into the live stream. I want everyone to stay safe and healthy. And we will see everyone back on Tuesday. And it is Halloween for the next live stream. If you want to wear a costume for the Zoom meetup, that's totally fine with me. But everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you back on Tuesday. Goodbye.